Hello, welcome to League of Josh podcast. Today I have a discussion with Taylor Abril. Taylor is a U of University of Hawaii alumni. He was two-time All-American in his uh, later two years. He then went to Italy for three years and now he's in France. He's a member of the United States of America national team for volleyball. Generally, he's just a super cool guy. I reached out to him a while ago and asked if he would be he'd be interested in doing this I kind of he caught my eye with a lot of his functional training and his his desire to move more into a community space and kind of give back to the community and in, in, in a volleyball realm so he's been messaging he's been messaging back and responding to dms from everyone that messages him so not necessarily saying go and message taylor but he'll he'll respond like he's a really big community guy so that's why I wanted to talk to him and Generally, he's just a really amazing human. He's a total Cali bro. Um, his philosophy on things are very, very cool. I really like the how transparent he was. This is one of the a, a more personal podcasts that I've done, and we were really comfortable with being transparent with one another right from the start. This is the first time that we've ever talked to each other. So the first little bit of the podcast is kind of me explaining who I am, and then from there we can dive more into the philosophy of movement and the philosophy of becoming better. Those are two of the general topics is self-actualization and movement and how that incorporation of the tools that we're given in making the best version of ourselves. So I really hope that you guys enjoy the episode. I really enjoyed the conversation. That was the, it was, it was probably one of my favorites so far. So thanks a lot for supporting guys. Um, I hope you enjoy. All right, we're, also, we're, is it is it just the uh, audio or is it video too? Video too. Okay. Yeah, I hope that's all right. No, I just like wish I had better lighting in this house, but once seven o'clock comes, we dim it, dim down. Yeah, no, I I like that. I I'm I'm on the same uh, same vein there. So sweet. Yeah. So this is this is a podcast. I've been doing this for. Uh, I had a significant injury kind of thing a few years ago, and then that had this cascading effect on my life. And I decided that I was going to pick up a podcast and just talk to Wait, wait, wait. I have to stop you there. Give me okay. like a little, a quick, I'm sure everyone who's okay. listening yeah. knows who you are, but like, give me a quick, uh, we're just meeting each other right now yeah. live on air. So yeah. that's cool. Uh, okay. <laughs> my name is Josh. Um, I played volleyball at Thompson Rivers University in Canada, British Columbia, <laughs> four hours north of Vancouver. That's all you got to know. Okay. Um, uh, was playing as an outside hitter. Actually, I played everything. I played middle, opposite, outside, uh, not set or not libero, unfortunately. And then um, going into my fourth year, I kind of had a breakout year in my third year, was doing pretty well on the outside. And then fourth year, third year summer, uh, blew my right Achilles. And so then got fired from my job, girlfriend and I broke up, uh, big cascading life event who am I what's going on all this other stuff and so from there I started a podcast and just wanted to talk to people that I thought were fun and cool and interesting and then got back into volleyball uh well I actually went and traveled Asia that summer um I was supposed to go to Korea and train there with the team but then their coach got fired while I was in Vietnam like seven days before I was actually supposed to fly to Korea, I got a, I got a text from my Thompson Rivers coach saying, hey, the Korean coach got fired. There's no training opportunity. Good luck for the next month. And, and, and the thought, trip was what? Just for you to like go explore and, and do some drugs and find yourself? Or what yeah, kind of trip were so, we talking about? So it started, so we have a, a sister school called SKK in Korea to tier mm -hmm. you. And so the goal was to go there and kind of have a, a reintroduction to volleyball because I hadn't played for, it was like a year and three months, a year and a half at that point. And that was going into my final year, my senior year. So, so it was this, uh, this effort by the coach and we send a guy every year during the summer. So it was, the, it was an effort by the coach, Pat, uh, to send me there and kind of get me reintroduced and get me a bunch of reps. So I'm kind of up to speed coming back into it. And yeah, so went there. It was supposed to be a month, and I. It was supposed to be a month in July. Nobody wants to hire someone for May, June, August. So I 
decided, hey, I've got four months, I might as well go and travel Southeast Asia. That's something I've always wanted to do. So if I'm already going over there, I'm going to go travel Southeast Asia, go through Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And then from Vietnam, I'll fly up to Korea and do my training there and then fly out. So first half of the trip goes great, flying through everywhere. And like I said, seven days before I'm supposed to go to Korea, I get a text from my coach and he says, hey, go find a monastery that'll take you in for the next month. Good luck. I'll, I'll see you in, I'll see you at training camp. Um, so like I'm, I'm just stuck in Vietnam and don't have anywhere to stay in Korea. I knew a guy, but I like couldn't go to Korea. So I, anyway, I ended up flying to India because I heard about this, uh, Vipassana meditation and this sound therapy that I had been practicing with this guy that I was running a hostel with in Vietnam. And so I went out to India and traveled India and then went up to Nepal and yeah, did all this weird random crazy stuff and then flew i love it dude i love it that's Um, so cool i mean that's it's something that i've always you know my plans when i'm done is to to take a trip and just travel and be alone and those are i think those are really um man especially for me been doing this for so long now it's like i would love i would love a vacation you know yeah like truly i would love just some time so that's just i'm uh frothing at the mouth listening to like a fun trip of just like figuring it out i love it it was it was so strange because there were so many things that happened along the way that like you, you could say that my mom always talks about like these energies and these energies pulling people and yeah i see what's that back there is that the chi or something yeah this is all um these are all uh god damn it what are they called um the chakra centers so these are all the chakra yeah. centers this is my mom's yeah, place yeah. this is uh she's super into buddhism and Cool. All of that side of philosophy in life. So she always talks about these these pushing and pulling factors in life, and there's this energy and this more or less divine plan. Um, at least like we have options within it, but the the general course is to go this way. And like if bad things happen to you in some form, then it's pushing you to this other way. And that's kind of your path. Um, and and so yeah, that's cool all- that that came from your your mom. Did you have that growing up? Uh, yeah, that type I, of influence I, in your life. Yeah, so um, her and I were really close. And then from, I think I was 12 to 20, we didn't talk. She, we had this big blow up, um, never talked to her. She ended up moving down to Phoenix and uh, going to school down here and then got a job down here and living down here. So we didn't talk for like nine years, but that was always kind of a foundation of my life. She would take me, I I grew up very um, religious Catholic on my dad's side and went to church every Sunday. And then with my your mom, parents were split. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so they were, they were split. They, they split like basically as I was out of the womb kind of thing, mm. like they, so they were split up for my entire life. And so my mom was very into like, she would take me to, she exposed me to lots of other religions kind of as a like, Hey, look at all these other things. It's not just this mm. one thing. So I grew up from, <laughs> a very religious praying at the like saying prayers at the table and going to church every Sunday and Sunday school and then on this other side it was going to Buddhist monasteries and like falling asleep in the front row because I was super tired after practice or whatever but mm-hmm. going to, to synagogues and all of these other things so I grew up with kind of this multi-religiosity perspective wow yeah yeah that's so that amazing well. I can relate relate in a different way I also grew up Christian both my parents work in the church actually mm-hmm. cool. um I'm not a religious guy, um, mm-hmm. but that's, this is a whole nother conversation we can choose to have at some point, but that's just, that's, that's really interesting. You grew up with like almost two uh, opposite sides of the story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think my mom kind of saw what was happening because my grandparents would pick me up every Sunday and take me to Sunday school. And my mom mm-hmm. was like, yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I think that she thought that I wasn't getting as diverse a perspective as I could be. So, so she took it upon herself to whenever I was with her, we were always exploring all of these other things. She at the time was was into to Buddhism and more of a Zen philosophy stuff. So so I was able to kind of jump off that as a platform. Wow, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. yeah. What an interesting upbringing. Wow. Yeah. Was, and you're now now where are you? So now I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. So Phoenix. So the rest of that story. So I. Um, <clears throat> 
go to go to India. So there are all these things. Uh, I, like I met this really cool girl in Laos, and she told me about this type of meditation, Vipassana. It's a ten day silent re- silent retreat. You literally meditate 15, 16 hours a day, and don't say a word, don't write, don't have a phone, nothing. It's just you and your mind, and like all you do is meditate. And so I thought, well, that was, yeah, super scary. Seriously, horrifying. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but people, <laughs> people that would want to do it will just do it because they, they want to, but I wouldn't recommend it. Sure. Um, and then when I was in Vietnam, there was an unfortunate circumstance. Someone passed away and I ended up running a hostel for 10 days. And during that time, there was this Argentinian guy who couldn't speak very good English. Uh, good for me, I spoke Spanish. And so him and I got along super well. We run this hostel together and he teaches me sound therapy and both him and this girl are like, you have to go to India to, to kind of dive into these things. Like you need to go and find a, a guru or a sensei, any, whatever you want to call it. And so once Korea got canceled, it was like this, this flurry of, I, I, I need to go and do something else because I, I can't go to Korea for, for a full month. I need to cancel the flight. Didn't end up getting anything back or whatever, but I went to India and things just lined up. There was this new Vipassana center coming up and someone had canceled at this sound therapy thing. So I was able to get into both of those. And then I went to Kathmandu in Nepal and like cruised the streets looking for like these authentic seven metal singing bowls that were, that they have to be a particular vibration. And so I spent 10 days there just like locked in this dark room for 16 hours a day. Same thing, just playing sounds and having a, um, an, not an amplifier, uh, like a sound recorder to tell me the frequency. And so I just did that yeah. for until I found this perfect set, bought those. And then I came back to Canada, um, played my fifth year, and then wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Ended up going to Denmark to play for a season. And then about three and a half months ago, I ruptured my other Achilles. So now. And I'm how old are you now? 23. Wow. Yeah. So now I'm in Phoenix uh, because I couldn't get <laughs> access to a pool in Canada. I had to make a border run and fly over here before everything locked down and then start rehabbing. So my mom has a pool in the backyard because she lives in Phoenix and everyone has a pool in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So now I've just... And you ruptured your Achilles? My second one. I ruptured both of them now. (laughs) Oh no, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So so now... That's probably the one injury I haven't had yet. It sounds uh, like not a good time. Yeah, it's really good if you want to dive into yourself and figure out who you are. And yeah, learning to walk again is always fun. You can believe that, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. So that's, that's my life. Uh, I recently started doing more podcasts, trying to get kind of back into it and seeing how far I can take it and how far it can take me if I just dive into it and really put together maximum effort. If I put everything into it, let's see, let's see where this goes kind of thing. That's my, that's my perspective on it. Sweet. And what's the, like, uh, what's your niche for the show? Are you just like just seeing what comes your way? Yeah. Finding the niche for the show is generally finding niches for other people and researching them as much as I can. And then trying to pull interesting information out of other people. So, so my general process or way of thinking at least is like, if, if you and I know the things that we know individually. And then there's this overlap of the things that we know together. So both you and I, I'm sure know some things about physiology and all these other things. So the more that I know what you already know or what's possible for both of us to know, then the more I can dig into the things that only you can know. So I wanna know, I I wanna dig into people with difficult, um, more intricate questions of kind of who they are as a person, how they think, what their philosophies are, how they've learned the things that they've learned and generally things that you can only learn through life experience or through um, being an expert in a particular field. So my, my role, my goal is to be a generalist and dive into the ideas that people know a lot better than me by knowing a little bit and being able to pull the more difficult information out of them. Well, I love this. We're going to get along great, dude. Perfect. I'm very excited. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's my whole deal. That's my, that's the, the goal of this is to kind of 
make a long form conversation with interesting people available where we dig into deep questions and dive into kind of the foundation of people's psyches and how they become experts in the thing they're experts in and generally just provide interesting content for people that want it. Cool. Well, dude, thanks for having me. This is, this is rad. Man, thank you. Thank you. No, seriously, that was, uh, I'm super glad that we were able to work it out. I know the time difference is difficult, so I'm glad you were able to find some, find some time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I always think there's not enough time in the day, and at the end of the day, there's always enough time in the day, you know? Yeah, yep. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you just got to make it. It's tough, though. We're, we're pulled in so many different ways. Yeah, I feel you. Okay, so I don't, don't be weirded out by any of the questions. Uh, if you're not comfortable at answering something, you can just kind of like move around it, and I'll 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 pick up on. You have it a safe just... a safe word. Yeah, we can have a safe word. Uh, Spumoni. I think that's a good Spumoni one. Spumoni works. I was gonna go with tippy toe. Tippy toe. Yeah, I haven't been able to do tippy toes in a long time. Get that's a Seinfeld reference. I don't know if anyone will understand oh, that one. I was doing. Um, <laughs> What is it? Jackie Moon, uh, Will Ferrell. It'll come to me. Um, Blaze okay. of Glory. Uh, no. Um, no, dude. Semi pro. Semi pro. Thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't. You can't start off the podcast with with leaving me with that and we us not knowing <laughs> the answer. That would just piss me off. For the entire I'm, time. I'm, man, I'm glad you're on it. Okay, so like like I said, don't be don't be weird about any of the. <laughs> no, questions. you're good, man. Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, as far as I've gathered from another thing is like I, I like to do my research so um, what I've gathered from your life your spiritual journey your adventure is you have an unfortunate circumstance as an anteater um, there's a thing with some silly psilocybin and you end up being off the team and then you go to Hawaii and you have another unfortunate circumstance there where you're indefinitely suspended um my 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 general question is how how is all of that worth it because i think that a lot of people find themselves in difficult circumstances and they believe that it's totally the end of the world only to find later on that it was actually a, a quite good experience whether in the moment it was something horrible it's very emotionally arousing and hurts us in the moment but after it's kind of what's necessary for us to become our better selves um in Tibetan Buddhism, it's this idea of death rebirth cycles and going to hell and coming out and becoming the best version of yourself. And so mm -hmm. I want to know why was all of that worth it for you? Great question, dude. I mean, <clears throat> let's put it, I'll say this, like, I mean, I was 19, 18, yeah. 19. And uh, I grew up really like looking back, I, I grew up really privileged, you know. Mm -hmm. And so when you grow up like, in in a family that they loved you no matter what and uh just a, a circumstantially um it's <clears throat> you're not thinking about i didn't have that kind of foresight you know mm -hmm. where i really where i was really mature enough to be able to understand the consequences of potentially you know getting caught for doing mushrooms or getting caught for doing cocaine or you know these things that exist in the college realm in the university realm and um, I think at that age, you, look, I, I just think I was the kind of guy that needed to make the mistake to learn the lesson, which, mm. okay, aren't we all, we all learn from our mistakes more or less, but even to this day is somewhere where someone who don't, I don't do well with people telling me what to do or trying to guide me really, unless I really respect their opinion. And, um, I just think, you know, I was always trying to find the way for me to you know as long as for me it was like as long as i took care of what was um important which at the time was school and volleyball that's why you go to university to play volleyball and to get an education and <clears throat> i was always like a good student let's say or like 3.0 or above so school was always something that um, it didn't come easy to me but i was able to um, do what i had to do to get grades that were good and uh, volleyball didn't come easy, but I worked really hard and loved that process of training and um, 
And so for me, it was just like, those things were really taken care of. And, and to me, it was like, well, if what I do outside of that doesn't seem to have a direct effect on those two things, then I should be able to do whatever I want. And uh, that's exactly what happened is mm -hmm. I thought that this other thing wouldn't have a direct, it's not like I took mushrooms and the next month I was like lost all my coordination or, you right. know, forgot uh, how to fill out a Scantron or something, you know? So it, it didn't feel like it had this direct effect on um, me as a student athlete. And uh, so when you ask <laughs> what made it all worth it, it's like not knowing, being ignorant a little bit. You know, I wasn't thinking about like, oh, man, I mean, of course, it came by my mind that like, all right, mushrooms are illegal. And they're um, like smoking weed is like we get drug tested, even though I never got drug tested. We did get drug tested. Right. It was like part of being an NCAA athlete. Um, but you're just I think at that age, you're just not at least for me, I wasn't capable of of understanding what the consequences could be of um doing something that you know could could affect those two things that i thought i had taken care of in a, in a negative way and you think that you'd learn from the first mistake <laughs> but again like you know i made that mistake i would never forget like calling my parents and just like crying like can't believe i'm getting kicked off the team for this and really now i'm gonna have to transfer schools mm -hmm. but you know i have amazing parents who were just like obviously bummed and we had our moment but then it was like we love you do what you know and I'll, I'll never forget having conversation with my dad about like you know thinking volleyball was over I really did once I got kicked off the team was like you know what like it's maybe it's over maybe I'll do music I come from a very musically inclined family and so I was like oh you know maybe I'll do something in the music world or but I had no like I wasn't playing guitar my whole life or like I had no real musical talents I'm a terrible voice and uh so the point is I had like a real loss of identity and then I was like, all right, let's, let's just keep training and let's keep in. And at that time, dude, I was like the most free I'd ever been, mm -hmm. you know? So I was like, really, you know, you talk about going to, you know, Southeast Asia and like kind of exploring yourself. Like that's what I was doing in Newport beach. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I happened to have some influences at the time existentially that I felt like I really connected with that were a lot older than me and kind of, um, I was just at that age where I was questioning everything and trying to understand um, about the world around me. And uh, so then I go to Hawaii, I get an opportunity to play in Hawaii. And, you know, I think, okay, I got unlucky. Like I did mushrooms and someone emailed our coach. Like, come on. I didn't like, you know, run to the middle of the street or do some like stupid shit, run around naked and got caught by a news outlet. Like, you know, I was just like, that was unlucky. And uh, so similar circumstances happen I go to Hawaii as a freshman and make similar mistakes um and ha already had built a reputation as like a good time guy you know yeah. like a party kid you know and I remember when um my coach at Hawaii was like dude other coaches were telling me like why would you take this kid he just wants mm -hmm. to fuck around and whatever and and I worked again for me it was like dude I just worked really hard I worked really hard in school and volleyball and I I think I just do everything to an extreme, let's say, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's like when I'm in one moment, I think I did a really good job of living in the present, maybe too good of a job, let's say. But like, you know, like when I show up to practice, that's oh, it's what I was thinking about, training. And then when I left, it's like, I don't need to talk about volleyball. It's over, it's done. And I knew on to the next thing. And so it would be like, volleyball's taken care of, school's taken care of, it's the weekend. I'm gonna go party and have fun mm -hmm. with friends because I'm 19 years old. And I'm not thinking about the consequences of drinking and driving or, um, you know, like any of those kind of mistakes that you can make as a, someone who's young and new to a lot of those things. And uh, then that caught up with me again, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, then I hit a real moment for myself that was really just like, it's happening again. In fact, when I was let go from the team, uh, I will never forget, being at this place called Blaze and Steaks with this guy, Jeff Hall, who was our assistant coach, talking about playing in Canada. Mm -hmm. It was like, well, no one in the U.S. wants you now, for sure. You can't, you can't actually transfer to another school because you've already used your one-time transfer, whatever the rule was. Mm -hmm. So I was talking about like going to McMaster maybe or going to like these other Canadian universities and being like, oh, my God, I'm in fucking Hawaii. I'm not going to 
you know, knuckle puck city, dude, <laughs> it's freezing out there, you know, I can't handle that. Yeah. And uh, again, just like really, really privileged kid who was like, dude, I, I don't, there's no way. I started crying. Like, dude, I can't believe, I can't believe. Like then it became there. That was a short moment where it became real. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so funny because, you know, I've had people ask me like, Oh, what's the, like, what's the real lesson? You know, is it not, don't do drugs? Is it these different things? And um, it's been so funny to try to answer because I think all the time, like, okay, if I could like, if future me could go back to a younger version of myself and be like, Hey bro, trust me, don't take those mushrooms, dude. Cause like this kid is going to say like, you know, I just, uh, I look back and I think, man, there's literally nothing anyone could have told me that would have made me not do what I want, what I felt like was okay to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's been so strange to try to like give advice to kids or try to answer some of those questions because I'm just like, man, what, I wouldn't have listened to anything anyone said, mm -hmm. you know, it's so, this is such a strange thing to be like, there's so many kids out there. I'm sure that are, um, have very different upbringings that maybe are being introduced to psychedelics or to weed or drinking or partying that kind of lifestyle. And as much as I want to be like, don't do that. It's just not the reality. Like they're going to do what they want to do. And so I'm almost just leaving this as an open format. Maybe you can help me discover this answer, dude. Like yeah. I, I don't have a good response for some people when it's like, I mean, obviously there's a ton of lessons I learned and we can get into that later if you want to, but like, the hard part has been like, what, what advice would you give when you know, like to my, what advice could I have given myself if I know like I, I wasn't gonna listen to anyone, mm -hmm. you know? The Rock, The Rock came to my school and was like, yo, don't do drugs. I'd be like, this guy smokes weed, man, come on. <laughs> you know, like. If this guy's cooking. <laughs> yeah, for sure, I don't know. I, uh, I, I don't know, cause I, so my, so I, I like definitely would have gone into trades had it not been for volleyball. I didn't know that you could actually go and play volleyball after junior high or high school or mm -hmm. getting into club I was like oh whoa there's this you can you can go and go to university and do this I had no idea and so when I when I was young I constantly was told by my professor or not professors but like school teachers I remember being like the third grade being like I'm gonna go to university and my teacher just laughing at me and being like you're not gonna go to university like you don't get good grades you're all over the place you're running around during class like you're not going to university and so that was always this thought in my head as I grew up and and it was that I was just this dumb kid and I wasn't going to go to university if anything I was going to go and do trades which I would have been fine with my, my dad and my brother do trades it's a very honorable profession um, but I I went I, I wouldn't have gotten into school most likely if I weren't playing volleyball I think that my coach pulled some strings to get me in um, and then my first year, I almost failed out, lost my athletic scholarship fully, and then went back the next year, did a little bit better, and then the next year I did a little bit better, and then after I ruptured my Achilles, I decided, like, I'm gonna, and I, I was kind of the same thing, I was partying a lot, and I was kind of this, socially, I was the, the kind of weird kid that would always have a good time. Um, always questioning things, always asking why, which was super frustrating for a lot of guys, I'm sure. Like, why? Why do I have to do that? Why aren't you doing that? Why? Why do? Why are we doing this drill? What's? What are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And so I think over time, like I was kind of this, uh, yeah, like I said, annoying kid. And, um, and then as time went on, I started to pick up more responsibility. And actually, after I almost failed out, my coach sat me down in a room and said like, Hey, you have to go, you have to talk to your mom. Like, I, like as a parent, it's something that I think that I think that it's this part of your life that it has been removed and you're totally out of whack. Like, I think that it would be good. They were in contact via email cause she was helping to pay for my rent and through, through an RESP. And so they were in contact and he was like, Hey, you, you just got to reach out. Like, I think if you guys have a conversation and I remember her and I had a conversation and I had to put it, like I had to put my phone on mute to cry during our conversation because I hadn't heard her voice in nine years and her and I were inseparable when we were, when I was a kid. And so I, I would have to put it on mute and cry. And then after our phone call and I would just have like one word answers, take it off mute, like, yeah, mute. And then that went on for a few minutes. And then I cried for like three hours after, and then our relationship got better and better and better. And it was just this 
this loss of something and this loss of, of me in a sense, because we're 50, 50, 50 mom and dad, the mom gives us the mitochondria, whatever there's some, it's a little bit muddy there, but, but that was like a part of my personality. And so I think that regaining that allowed me to be a more full version of myself. And then going forward, I kind of took on more responsibility and more responsibility and knew myself better. And so I went from like failing out in my first year to in my last year, and I think I was taking three and three or three or three and four classes per semester. And just like not going to class. That was, that was a thing. I just didn't like business. I was like, I'm not going to go to class. I'm just going to hang out and sleep all day, whatever. And then in my fifth year, I ended up being on the Dean's list, taking six classes per semester. And, and, and so I actually think the, the answer to that question, like, what would you tell yourself if you were young? I wouldn't tell myself anything. I would just kind of watch and be like, oh, you're going to get smacked. Like, like life is going to come around and absolutely whoop you. And it's going to be totally worth it. And, and that's kind of what I meant by my question as well is looking back in hindsight, why was, why was all of that suffering inevitably worth it in your life now? Because I think that, I think that we have to go through those points of suffering. I, I don't think I would wish that, uh, that you didn't suffer. Yeah. I yeah. I, I wouldn't yeah. wish that upon anyone. Like I wouldn't mm -hmm. like my kids when they grow up. I mean, if I, if I had the to, irony in this, you know, yeah, you wish yeah. suffering upon people. Yeah. <laughs> seriously. It's actually a great thing. I'm here. I'm there with you, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah. a, like, that would kind of be my answer to that question. It's like, maybe I, maybe I'd recommend that he invest in Bitcoin. But besides that, I would just be like, good luck, dude. This is going to be an unbelievable experience. You're going to hit these peaks and valleys and, you're going to be on top of the world and you're going to go to hell and you're going to emerge from that and you're going to become better than what you were. And you're going to go through that over and over and over again throughout your entire life. There's going to be heartbreak. There's going to be pain and suffering and failing, but over time you're going to get better. And I think that's the meaning of this all is that we, we get better over time. If you're not, we're, we're not, we're not all staying stagnant. And even if you are stagnant, then you're, I think devolving because things just naturally go from, order to disorder mm -hmm. unless you're putting effort in to stop that that entropy so i i really think that the answer is just like get better but everyone has their own process everyone has to give be given this freedom to fail and like what uh like Char Char Man, what is yeah i know you go oh no i was just gonna say it it makes me think of why like um why like um what's the best way to word this <laughs> they just say like immigrants come into the u.s mm -hmm. but basically people who come from other countries nowadays have this like completely different world view and there's just so many success stories of like guy comes from india with his family and like starts a business and becomes successful and those guys work they're notorious for working really hard and mm -hmm. and all of that is because they come from a place of like um I can imagine like so much less fortunate. They're so much less fortunate and they come to a place like America and they see that opportunity. Right. And I think that's what happened to me is I then entered a space that was like, this is uh, the third world version of you, let's say, yeah. you know, where like volleyball's gone. All the things you were like so comfortable having are gone now. And now you're going to have to go to another university maybe, or maybe be done and you're going to have your, what you was your purpose in life ripped away from you. Mm -hmm. And I think, then that the having that feel so real it took those failures for that mo to have that moment of like oh shit this is real and like this is now the second time that my identity feels like it's it's being stripped of me mm -hmm. you know and there was a real moment where i just decided like okay i'm not like kicked off the team see you later never again but they were like don't come back for the rest of the year and like you're not on the team mm -hmm. but there just still felt like this potential chance and i remember being like this is literally all i have now i i need to just like it was my final moment you know mm -hmm. of just being like i need to clean everything up diet work ethic dude i worked man I, I at the time i i had had a shoulder surgery that summer i had a slap tear mm -hmm. and so i was about three weeks post three or four weeks post um surgery by the time i was let go from the team literally at the beginning of the year basically mm -hmm. and i remember being like waking up at 6 a.m going to work out doing rehab working out again after that 
like crushing school literally so from that moment on i got a 4.0 for the rest of my career my last my rest of my three years at hawaii and you know i had like so many luck so many events happened in my life where then i met this guy named daniel marchong who was this mm -hmm. really unorthodox style trainer who just like took me under his wing and decided he was gonna like help me rehab he just happened to be in the gym like life just happened to be like here's your here's your second here's your third chance Mm -hmm. You know, like, this is it. We're going to give you this guy. Like, don't fuck this up. And I, dude, I spent six hours a day, like, meticulously making sure that I was doing all the right things. And, um, like, physically, and then go home and, like, I stopped partying as much and, like, stopped doing really all those things that were distracting from you that could, I, I no longer would, like, put myself in a position where it's, like, should I be here? Should I be doing this? Like, what if I get – I just, like, refused. It was just, like, there's no more. And that became so much clearer because of the mistakes that I had made. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so that's, that's my, I think, my answer to, to that question, if I did answer the question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, man, you did a great job. The, uh, the Daniel Marchong thing, I think, is fun. Because I – so when I was in India, there was a – I had, I had to take this bus and they, they just have school buses. They're really loud. They, they always, they always double up the horns. This is unrelated to the story, but it's kind of neat. Um, they always double up the horns on whatever vehicle you have. So like if you have a motorcycle, you put a car horn into it. And if you have a car, you put a bus horn into it. And if you have a bus, I swear to God, you put a, like you put a fog horn into it. Like everything's so <laughs> loud. I think my hearing, so is, my hearing will never be better. Or never be like, because people would like ride up behind you on a bridge on a motorcycle and just honk right in your ear. You, Gnarly. Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, one morning I'm, I'm oh my supposed God, I to could take, imagine that in LA, dude. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Sorry. Like it's, uh, yeah, if it, if it were LA, then the whole city would be deaf. The fucking uh, nightmare. <laughs> um, so one morning I have to like go and take this bus and go down to, um, this place called Hastinapur to go and do my Vipassana and so I'm in my hostel and I go and talk to the lady at the front desk and go hey I, I need a ride to this bus it leaves at five in the morning like early leaves at six in the morning I have to leave at five can any of you guys take me and she's like yeah absolutely okay the and this the sleeping regime is a little bit different in India normally people will sleep until like 11 in the morning so I'm like, mm. hey, are you sure that this guy's going to be able to take every me? college kid's dream, dude? Exactly. Oh man, and they like, you either wake up super early and work until like eleven, and then you take a two or three hour nap, and then you work until like eight. So, mm. so, so then, so anyway, so this, I talk to this girl, and I'm like, are you sure that this guy's going to be able to take me? She goes, yeah, absolutely, he's going to be there, hundred percent. And I ask her a few times because I'm like, I, I kind of know the culture. I'm like. I, I got to be on this bus. And she's like, no, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's on the other side of town, whatever. And so I wake up in the morning. I go down at 445 just to make sure that everything's parsimonious, everything's fine. And this guy's not there. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll wait a while, whatever. And 5 o'clock, 5.15. So I'm waking people up, and nobody has a bike. Nobody has access to a bike. And then the manager comes down, and the manager doesn't get out of his room before noon ever like all of the people were like whoa what are you doing up man he's like oh, i just like I, I woke up at five and couldn't fall back asleep so i came down to to hang out i heard some people down here and i'm like dude can you can you take me on your bike he goes yeah sure man hop on so so him and i bike all the way to so he's like my saving grace so we bike to the bus station and i pull out a wad of my like all my indian cash i'm not sure how much i had it it was a lot of money i'm like dude take this you just saved my life he's like no i'm your angel like in 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 the indian in the in the hindu philosophy and there, there are angels that come in and help us in moments that we need them and so he wouldn't take my money he wouldn't take anything he just wanted a hug and he was like i'm your angel man sometimes people come into our lives and it's these little blips these momentary things whether it's a short moment or a long moment but people come into our lives and they fulfill this role and we might never see each other again. Unlikely that we ever do. He was like, I'm your angel. God sent me to be your angel for this moment. And it was just this wow. unbelievably cool experience of this person being so altruistic and just having this faith and being like, yeah, man, go like, whatever, go, go on. Wow. I, I, I was meant to take you here. He was like, mm. like God woke me up this morning. And obviously it's not like, uh, gray beard in the sky catholic god it's this sure. hindu god and he's like 
yeah, it was, it was very cool. So I think that uh, the Daniel Marchong is a similar example to that, where this guy just kind of comes out of nowhere, right time, right place. And but completely bald. Yeah. Basically, no hair, no facial hair. <laughs> no, yeah, it sounds really similar. And, you know, I think a lot of times um, we'd, you'd be surprised at how many, like, he was my guy now, but you'd be surprised how, like, this conversation could inspire me to be whatever. Like, those little, let's right. say, gurus are really all around you if you're willing to be open to listening to life and what it brings you. And sometimes it's uh, <clears throat> very obvious, like, like Daniel, for me, where it was just like, wow, what an opportunity I'm getting right now. Right. And sometimes it's a little conversation you have, you know, that can just make such a huge impact and completely change the course of your life. I mean, dude, I remember, like, I played, um, I played in Italy for three years. And mm -hmm. one of those years, I lived um, right next to this, like, butchery, basically. And this dude at this, like shitty butchery that had no heating inside it for some reason like in the middle of winter open every day just like selling fucking meat dude this guy was just selling meat and slanging like basic grocery items in his little market but he lived right by my house and i would get meat there i'd get my meat there and mm -hmm. we talked all the time and by the, my third year in, in italy i was like not fluent but conversationally could handle that type of conversation and we could right. speak and we spoke every day and I just remember looking at that guy being like, dude, you have so much, he just had so much passion for life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that like to see someone have so much joy. And I'm just like, dude, all, all he does is cut meat and like works in this cold store every day in this Busto Arsizio, which is like 30 minutes outside of Milan, just like cloudy city. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's funny how like I would get so inspired from meeting a guy like that you know, and, and that that bled into like having those little moments bleeds into my life. Right. You know, if I go to uh, the other way, the other day I went to like the mail, um, kind of like the USPS for here. Yeah. Post office. My God, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> went to the post office to deliver a letter. And I remember the guy who was working at the front counter just was like so happy, you know, just mm -hmm. what's up. And obviously I'm in France now. So he was speaking in French, but um, just, just had this like smile and happiness where it just made me realize, like, I get those little moments, you know, where I'm like, wow, like life's telling me to like, Hey, you play professional volleyball. Like life's not that bad, you know, because I, I have my dark days out here too. And so it's like, so amazing to just to have those, let's say little gurus that every single day, like life in some way seems to give me some sign. And if I'm open to it, you know, I, I take that moment and that's able to, to then bleed into my, the rest of my day. And I just think like, that's just such a, um, it's a cool, cool concept to think about, you know? Yeah. They, I, I think that, that, that you touch on a really cool area of the willingness to accept that, that joy into your life. There's a guy that works at the Kamloops A&W or the, the Wendy's, like right beside the, the residence complex. There's this Wendy's that we used to go to all the time. And there was this guy that would work there. I think he was the manager, but man, the guy just loved being there. And, and maybe he didn't love being there, but he just loved being. I think that was the, the point of it was that he just, mm. he was always super chipper, always in, into what you were doing. And he was always happy. He was always just stoked, super, like his posture was awesome. And he was just this older dude. And occasionally I'd go in there with like, I'd be getting some spicy chicken wraps with a rookie. And after we leave, they're like, man, why is that guy so happy? Like he works at NW. Like, no, man, that's not the point of it. The point of it is like, why is that guy so happy? And why can't you be like that all the time? Mm -hmm. Like this willingness to, to let things bleed into our lives. Because I think all the time, um, depending on who you surround yourself with, but lots of people will kind of refuse that and kind of go into this, um, like a like non-effective life being like, why can't everyone just kind of be plateau all the time and not up? You know, it's interesting. I have I have some friends who, um, who kind of who I would say, yeah, bleed into this idea of uh, not that it's okay to be negative, but it's like if I'm pissed about something, I should be able to be like, yo, I'm pissed about this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting. The concept in general is so interesting and something I think about because. I also want to live in a world where like, if you get pissed about something, it's okay to be pissed about something. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that is like, how much 
do you let it bother you? Mm -hmm. You know, like if someone cuts you off in traffic, like do you, does that does that then alter your attitude in the same way that if someone opens the door for you, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, yeah, the justification I've heard is has been for people in my life who have had who have a tendency to be a bit more negative has been like, well, this thing pisses me off, and I should be able to be pissed off by it. And it's so interesting because I don't really know the answers necessarily, you know, like to me, I'm like, I agree. If something pisses you off, it's okay to react. I just think that there's, um, I don't want to call it a level of maturity. What's the word I'm looking for? I just think there's something to, it's being okay reacting in a way, but um, letting it then affect you more than just the reaction i think is a skill that mm -hmm. seems to benefit a lot of people the ability to um not let those things ruin completely ruin your day yeah you know the uh the other day i was i've been trying to get a piano down here for a while i've been trying to learn and um we i i, I just spent a ton of time on marketplace and offer up all of that stuff and finally find this place and like literally lacing up my shoes to go my mom and I had the opportunity the day before, but she had a meeting, so she wasn't able to. And so I messaged the guy and say, hey, do you still have it? And he goes, no, I just sold it, sorry. And I was so angry because mm -hmm. there, there were a few other things that kind of built up and this was the straw on the back that I was just like, so angry I couldn't speak. And, and my mom was like, I'm sorry. And I, like, I couldn't have gone yesterday. And, and it was just this, I, the way that I, conducted myself was that for the rest of the day, I just worked. Like I worked on things. I worked on writing my lecture and I worked on editing things for the podcast and I worked on all of these other things, but I just totally threw myself into these things, put in my headphones, listened to music and just like went and just kind of accepted the feeling and used that in what I would say a, a reasonably responsible way. Like when you feel angry, when you feel that emotion, like I, I think anger is something that's a, like this very natural feeling that we can, we can alter and we can change into something productive. You can actually be very productive with anger. I think that that's a, a really cool part of, of emotion and anger is you can find use for everything. We wouldn't what does that look like for you? For me, for, for being, being useful in anger is just grinding. Like I put my head down. That's when I, like normally when I get super angry, I'll, and I'll go to the gym and just grind for a couple hours and, like those will be my longest workouts because I'm, I need to, I need to work this out. I need to throw some weight around. I need to like hit something. So I'm mm. using lots of med ball stuff. And, and, and in general, I think it just brings us to a different state of mind where we're very aroused, very over aroused. And well, scientifically definitely does. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, so we're very, very over aroused. And so for me, that's, that's this time where I can, really dive into something and give my entire attention to it. And then it becomes kind of this anger meditation where I kind of forget what I was angry about, but I still have that over arousal. I still have those, those neurochemicals in my brain that are, that are making me feel this way. And, and I kind of accept that and practice my breathing. And then, and then I kind of dance with it. Like I'm, I'm jiving with it so that I can be my best version of myself in that state of mind. Like it's not that that state of mind is bad, or that we shouldn't feel that way at any time or all the time. But how can you translate that emotion, that feeling, that those, those chemicals in our body, the, the endocrine system into this, into being productive, into being the best version of yourself with what you're given at that time. It's like to go through life without ever being angry is very unlikely, but how do you, how do you not let that affect your relationships and not, not only your relationships with others, but your relationship with yourself. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think physical exercise is definitely one amazing outlet. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, my something else that I find really helpful as well is just like having a sense of humor. Yeah. And uh, which is exactly why I'm having this phone call, this like Zoom with you is like the back and forth you and I had, it was just like even a couple sentences, just like he gets it, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, um, I, I think because that's my... That's my biggest qualm with uh, like a lot of the motivational, uh, spiritual kind of world that you see on like Instagram or the internet really. It just seems very like woo woo and not real, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where like, like 
at least for myself, I have a, a side of me that's very serious, like takes what I do very serious. But then the other half of me is like, nothing really matters, you know? Yeah. And um, I think I gravitate towards people who have that sense of humor and also that drive and discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having a sense of humor to me is like a huge sign of um, having the ability uh, not to find the best version of yourself, but to cope with different emotions that mm -hmm. arise, you know, like I have a great, I have a huge, like I have a great, I think I have a great sense of humor, but I still have days where I'm just fucking depressed. And yeah. if I'm being completely honest with you, today was one of them. Like, it's so funny. Today for me was like a really tough day. Mm -hmm. uh, I like woke up and didn't, had to go get, we're basically in quarantine right now because a teammate of mine got COVID. The whole rules are kind of ridiculous, honestly, in general. Um, yeah. But we got tested and we're all negative now. So we get out on Friday. But I had some ideas of something I wanted to do, but I had to go get this test I forgot about. Went there, got it, came back, trying to uh, back up my phone because I take all these videos all the time for like some right. media stuff. And like, so I, I just don't have enough storage on my phone. So I tried to put it on my computer. That took three hours trying to figure out how to get it to go to the cloud or how to put it on my external hard drive. I like couldn't mm -hmm. figure it out. And then it's finally figured out. And it's going to take like two hours to download. And I was just like, I needed to go work out and film some stuff and do something and just like, didn't do it. And finally said, like, fuck this. I was just so pissed. And I just like laid in my bed, started reading this book. I'm reading a book for the second time called Illusions. Um, which is a fucking amazing book. And I recommend it to everyone. It's short. It's easily digestible. Recommended to me by this guy named Austin Einhorn with the team of heroes, who's just like another uh, one of the gurus of my life where we really connect um, existentially as well as in the physical realm of, <laughs> of sports and volleyball. And uh, he's a trainer. He's awesome. Anyways, uh, I started reading this book. And like, as I'm reading, you know, like, you know, you, you, you're reading, but you catch yourself like, somehow having the ability to read words but also think about something completely different yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, i was catching myself reading but also thinking about the thing i was pissed about and i was like all right fuck reading i can't read now yeah and i just literally was like i'm gonna i feel so much better after i sleep i'm just gonna like lay here and just listen listen to the conversation going on in my head mm -hmm. so i wasn't like meditating or i'm gonna do some breathing some things that maybe could have helped some like forceful meditation physical e exercise um breathing exercises things i know like physiologically will help me get out of this state and yet mm -hmm. i was like fuck those things i know the resources i know they're right there i could just mm -hmm. take them off the shelf and, and put in my backpack and go but i said no i'm gonna sit in this misery and just laid there for an hour just i should go work out i should go do this thing time's click it's four o'clock it's 4 30 and like didn't do any of the things that um that I wanted to do for the day. Finally, like put some stuff on, go out there. And all of a sudden I'm out on the sand, like about to do this workout. And I was like, I don't fucking do it. So I like kind of putzed around, did some mobility stuff. And I was like, fuck this, I'm taking a bath. And I went and took a bath for an hour, ordered sushi. And it's, that was a long story for really no reason. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm really trying to say is like, it's this interesting balance between um, knowing when to use those resources and like try to pull yourself out of something and then also being okay being upset yeah and being okay just like all right i'm pissed and angry but rather than like going outside into the world and like projecting that onto everyone i run into i'm gonna sit in my bed and close my eyes and just listen and it's just so funny how like took a bath, had some sushi. Now I'm talking to you. I feel fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it just, it doesn't make sense sometimes. And I'm just sitting there like, dude, the day before I was, I feel so good. I'm working on a bunch of new projects. I'm doing some things that I think will be really cool here in the near future. Um, I have so much to look forward to. I get to play as a professional athlete. I live in the most beautiful place I've ever played con in France. Mm -hmm. um, this place is ridiculous. I live on the beach. The sand is right in front of my house. And I was like beyond miserable today. You know, I think that it's, I think that's a cool thing that you brought up is that like the ability to accept that you're not doing great. I think that's kind of something that we're, we get stuck into. And then, like you said, with the, like, there's lots of, I, I would, I would call it pseudo Eastern philosophy kind of bleeding into Western culture. And like a lot of it comes down to this idea of like, 
everything should be okay and in balance all the time. But to have the good, you also have to have the bad. And I think that the ability to accept those emotions and accept that feeling is something that a lot of people either don't have or they try to push away to be like always good. Like I, in terms of, in terms of humor, um, when I first ruptured my Achilles, like my, my right Achilles, the first one, um, I would always get asked by people, like, hey, how are you doing? And it got to oh, dude, let's talk about it. I was so <laughs> I got so angry and so frustrated by like, the way that I saw it. It was just a lie. It was it was it was a lie for them, and it, it was a lie for other people to not feel uncomfortable because like, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm great, thanks. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Okay, I'll see you later. See you later. Sure. And so over over time, it just kind of wore on me and wore on me and wore on me, and I I, I almost stopped talking to people outside of my immediate circle completely. Like I would just put my head down and just go because I didn't want to have the same conversation over and over and over again. And it got to this point where people would ask how I was doing and I would respond to them honestly and be like, Oh, today I'm feeling kind of shitty. Like I'm like, it, it's a, it's a shit day. Uh, can't walk. And, and I would just like dive into everything that I was actually feeling. And, and it was, and I would like laugh about it the entire time because their faces were like, Oh, Oh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't, wasn't ready for this. Wasn't expecting this, but, mm -hmm. but I think that ability to be honest actually opened up a lot of relationships for me because it went from like, I, in, in a way I kind of started to find the, the real people where like I would tell them how I actually felt and they were like, Oh wow. I, I didn't know that's how you were feeling. And we would have a dialogue about it. And then some people would just go, Oh, okay, cool. I'll, like, I'll see you later. And, you know, this is where the idea I think of, like, um, when I look back in, especially in my college career, but also in my adulthood of where, like, drugs and some of that stuff played a role in my life. And I was not someone who was like, I have these deep down, like, really deep down problems. And, like, you know, drugs help me suppress those emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but to some degree, like, they do provide an escape, you know, mm -hmm. from... And, and that's why this is so hilarious to say, I think, but I have so much respect for sober people, like completely sober people for that reason of, man, it's so much easier to like be angry and just like go get high and watch Dave Chappelle and just yeah. fucking laugh for a couple hours. And uh, I just have so much, and, and as someone now who can't do those things because of drug testing guidelines and whatever, like living a much more sober life i don't really drink as much as uh for for a lot of reasons i don't need to like drink because of what it does to me physically um and i just don't recover as well i'm getting fucking older dude i drink like a couple beers and my knee fucking swells up and my fingers get swollen in the morning it's not good um but as someone who's truthfully still learning how to live completely sober um i've noticed that i've been like wow you know i like honestly, man, I, I, uh, I was smoked. I smoked weed my whole high school career, mm -hmm. and dabbled with a lot of those things into university as well for all four years, really. And so, living completely sober was like genuinely like a new concept for me. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was, <clears throat> rather than I had a rough day, and I'm just gonna come home and like smoke a little bit and kind of like. Again, you know, it became then a new thing of like, wow, I'm upset. And like, especially now, this is where it really gets amplified is being in quarantine. I don't have my girlfriend out here. I don't have my friends, family, nobody. No one I love is out here. Mm -hmm. I can't really meet friends. Like I have friends that I've actually met outside of volleyball, which is really important to have that balance. Yeah. We can't hang out. It's like irresponsible. I just have a teammate who just got COVID. Mm -hmm. And my personal opinions of COVID or whatever, that, that doesn't matter. I'm a part of a team, you know? Right. And I just think, uh, yeah, it's just been, this has been a really trying year because it's like, man, I live in the most beautiful place I've ever played. Like mm -hmm. so many amazing things are right in front of me. And I'm to that point, like, I'm not super depressed. I have a lot of great things going on. And I'm yeah. like, I'm really happy with the trajectory, trajectory, trajectory of my life right now. Um, 
but dude, I still like am baffled by like having these depressed days where I'm like, man, I'm like still learning how to like handle being angry, mm -hmm. you know, or handle having like being depressed. I never truly never felt depression until this last year I had knee surgery. I tore my patella tendon. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, I played in France halfway through the season, tore my patella tendon, didn't know for six months because we never got an MRI. We thought it was tendonitis. Played through the season on a bunch of like painkillers, basically. Came back with Team USA, was like, let's give you three weeks, no jumping, ramped up, played in BNL, the Volley Nations League. Was like, dude, I still have pain. Got it checked. It's torn. And now I can't go fulfill my contract in Poland. So this last year, I didn't play at all. Mm -hmm. And was the first time where I was like, here we are again. Like, there's multiple times where volleyball has been stripped away twice in the university and now again having a big injury kind of like sets you back of like oh here comes another six months of recovery and this was the right. first surgery i'd had since my shoulder surgery which was shit, it's crazy i think it was like 10 years ago but <laughs> but uh time flies man um but yeah i it was like the first time where i was like wow it's back to like what do i want to do with my life now mm -hmm. now it's like even more real to me you know because before it was like, oh, I could go play pro or I could go play the next level. Now it's like, I've been doing that for six, seven years. This isn't going to last the rest of my life, you know? Right. And uh, that becomes really real. And it's funny, I'm, I'm back to like trying to figure it all out again. And mm -hmm. in those moments, I was, dude, I was living in Porto in Manhattan Beach. I was living on the beach. At Airbnb, I like treated myself. I was like, I'm not overseas this year. Because the year before I was in this like dark, cloudy, rainy place, the entire this place called Shamal. It never saw the sun for like four months. And as a as a boy who grew up in California and went to school in Hawaii, that's hard for me. And uh was just like came back, couldn't play volleyball, and was so like genuine was genuine, like, oh, this is what people talk about when they say they're depressed. And I never felt like I could relate to that because I was like, what do you mean you're depressed? Like just there's so many ways not to be depressed. There's so many great things. I've had this amazing outlook on life. It's because I had this purpose that was being fulfilled, you know? Mm -hmm. And when that purpose all, the, all of a sudden gets stripped away, you realize like, oh shit, what's next? And so I tried, I like took a stand-up comedy class and was like, maybe I'll do stand-up comedy. And that's a fucking dark road to start going down for sure. You have years of playing like in front of like six drunk people at three in the morning for them not yeah. to laugh and talk shit. And like, dude, years of sucking like that <laughs> that turned out to be like as much fun as it was to try something that was uncomfortable um that's a dark road but the point is like i really wasn't sure and even to this day right now i don't know exactly what the future looks like and where i found confidence recently is in being like it's my whole life has always been about me mm -hmm. it's always been about my career and i'm gonna go play college volleyball and then I did that and got to get off the team. It's like, oh, I got I to gotta make it back on the team. I get back on the team. And it's like, I'm a two-time All-American. Now I'm going to go play professional. And then you play in the professional world and you realize, like, shit, it's a business. It's, all, it's really about – it's less about the team, ironically, at the professional level. Because mm -hmm. you, what you really want is to play super good and make a better contract on a better team. And that's the goal every year. Make a better contract on a better team on a better, in a better league. Mm -hmm. It's just the reality. And of course, like to win and stuff, you need to find a way to, to be a good teammate. And there's, that's a whole different conversation, but um, yeah, I think uh, I actually got really lost. I have no idea what I'm talking about. No, no, you're all good. <laughs> you're all good. So, uh, so there's this book um, called by, by a guy named Victor Frankel and it's man's search for meaning. And so this guy was in Austria, Switzerland. I think that's right. So he was in Austria, Switzerland with his parents while, while the Nazi invasion was moving eastward or what would that be? Southeast? Um, so, he, so he was in Switzerland and decided to stay. He had the opportunity to leave. He decided to stay with his parents. And he went through four death camps. And before this, he was a psychiatrist. So throughout, throughout this experience, his pregnant wife dies. Both of his parents die. And he he was a psychiatrist before and his, his goal was this thing called logotherapy and logos meaning being Latin for meaning. And then the obviously therapy. So his goal was to allow people to find meaning in life. So he was stepping away from psychoanalysis, which is the looking backwards into your life and looking at yourself currently. And his goal was to understand 
how we can find a place where we're moving forwards mm. and how do we have that thing that pulls us. And so that was, it, and, and from what it sounds, I, I, th I think depression is an interesting thing because I've kind of, like you said, through injury, through not knowing yourself, you kind of lose yourself and dive into this hole. Wait, and re really quick, I, stop I just wanted to, I just remember, I just want to finish my point on that long tangent. I took yep. really quick. Mm -hmm. The point is um, I, I found so much in, um, instead of looking at what's my next thing going to be looking at how can I help the world and best serve the world right now. Mm -hmm. And that, I just, just to like end what I was trying to like, that was the full circle is that's been kind of my new mission is rather than thinking about like, what's my next career going to be? What's my next, this going to look like? Um, what am I going to do with my life? Instead being like, I've spent 28 years focusing on me and my life. I've been truly like a selfish person mm -hmm. as we all have to some degree. And as I think it's okay to be, it's your own life to some mm -hmm. degree. You know what I mean? but I've spent so much time focusing just on me. And finally I've decided to kind of flip the script and focus on um, just helping others. And right now it's been the volleyball community. And right now it's mm -hmm. been like responding to anyone who DMs me or um, trying to post things to inspire people to do what had a huge inspiration in my life and like really trying to give back. So that was my, that was my point just to not, not make it like I was super depressed and I'm still super depressed. Like that's, that's yeah. what's helped me, you know, that's what kind of brought it full circle is to start thinking about like, how can I help, and build community mm -hmm. and which is something where you know being in quarantine especially now with COVID and everything it's like we've really lost the sense of community I think you yeah. know yeah. and you don't realize again like the the underlying thing with this whole conversation is like you don't realize how much um how important something is until it's taken away right it's so funny I get that with injuries too like mm -hmm. you you broke your Achilles or snapped your Achilles or whatever like you're probably like Achilles is the most important structure in the body yeah. you know like dude yeah. I, i've had every injury in the books playing professional volleyball and it's like you break your i broke my pinky i broke my thumb and each finger it's just like literally my hand doesn't work without my pinky can't yeah. play volleyball because i have a broken pinky or yeah. like for a week or whatever and you tape it together and or like you have a back injury and you literally can't get out of bed and you're like lower back is the most important thing to focus on and you just realize like actually the body as a whole is what's really important but yeah yeah, you don't realize how much you you really need something until it's or love something until it's taken away. Yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the thing. That's like the whole the whole point of depression, in a way, is that when you lose that meaning, you you kind of lose this will to not not necessarily a will, but like you lose this huge part of yourself. And I think that's when people start to slump into depression is when they don't have they don't have a goal for going forwards or they don't, they find that they don't have meaning. And that's kind of what Frankl talks about. So he, he talks about how people found meaning and how they actually used meaning to stay alive. And even if it were to some extent of like a fake meaning, like uh, one guy had a son and so his meaning in life, and, and there was a non-interference policy within the concentration camps where you couldn't, you couldn't cut someone down if they were hanging themselves. So you had to let people die if they were committing suicide. And so the only way to, to, to save people was to save them preemptively. And as a psychiatrist, it kind of falls to this guy. And so he convinces one guy to keep fighting to live because he has a son. And he convinces another guy to live because he's, he was in the middle of writing a book. And so he has to get out and finish writing this book. And, and they always knew when people would start to kill themselves because you just wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Like there'd be one morning, everyone's getting out of bed and someone goes, nope, I'm not moving. Like, this is it. I'm going to stay here. And then they get kicked out of bed and then they have to move on and do their thing all day. And then that kind of tail spins and then they would end up committing suicide. And so his whole idea was finding this meaning that gives you something to strive for in life. And that's how you pull yourself out. And from the sounds of it, correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but I, it, it sounds like your, your meaning is, it was this transition through through your injury where you went from me to we. And I, I do think that people need, I do think that people need to be in some sense, um, not narcissistic. I think that that's the, the far end of that personality trait is narcissistic. And then on the other side is completely altruistic and very agreeable, which you don't, that's not something that you want either because then you're constantly working for other people and not for yourself. And it's important to find something in the middle where I, I think it seems like for you that you're, 
like you, you enjoy helping people like that brings you joy in your life. And that's something that you've found meaning. So it's this, it's this transition and this, um, this weaving together of me and we where, you know, now, it's so, in Oh no, go for it. No, that, that's, that's pretty much it. So now I think that you've, you've hit this point where you're like, okay, meaning in life doesn't just come from an internal. I can find that elsewhere by helping other people. And that's actually something that Frankel talks about in one of his lectures is he gets everyone to write down on a piece of paper, what's the meaning in life. And everyone writes it down. And he asks one of his students, what did you, what did you put? And she says, finding meaning in life is helping other people to find meaning in life. And in that way, you're bringing a community with you. That's really cool, dude. And, and this, just cause I've had this conversation recently, actually um, made me think about like, that's, this is my, my thing with religion where it's like, man, I, I really wish I was religious sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, Bec and, and to be honest, like I've, as someone who's not religious and as someone who grew up in a Christian home, like you already know that I went through like my young university years of like trying to convince my parents basically that God isn't real. The stories aren't true. Like yeah. I've been through all of that and finally got to this spot of like, it's what puts you at peace. And, and now it's like, even though I, um, and this doesn't need to be a religious talk, but like, I'm not a religious guy, but I see so much beauty in, in different religions, mm -hmm. in the fact that they, they create this blueprint and structure for living a good life. Like mm -hmm. take the Bible, not as these are all true actual facts and take them as stories that have meaning. There's so much meaning in books like the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, I've always been like, damn, dude, I just wish I could be like, could, like, I wish, you know, I wish I could be the kind of guy that could just be convinced by a religion because I think the beautiful part is it gives humans a sense of meaning, which we all know is purposeful. You know, mm -hmm. it is something that we need to exist. Um, is something that I think is hardwired, like deep into our body, into our souls. And so um, I think for so long, I've been like, man, I wish like people, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to make this like a talk about religion. No, 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 dude. I do, like, wherever I, you want to take it, like I'm, like I. I no, I, I just think that there's, for people out there who um, aren't religious, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's a lot harder to find that meaning, mm -hmm. and doesn't make one uh, more worth pursuing than the other. But I will say there's something about um, people who have chosen a religion where it's like that that part's like I look at my parents where it's like they believe in, you know, eternal life and that, that kind of thing. And, and mm -hmm. I think like, man, how fucking sick to wake up every day and just be like, all good. I'm gonna live for, a, I'm fucking live forever. You know, yeah. like there's how, how beautiful, like mm -hmm. your sense of purpose is like spread the word of God or whatever mm -hmm. it is through whatever medium you do that, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that is so important. And so for people who don't have a religion, I think navigating that there's no, there is no blueprint, mm -hmm. you know? And I just think it's such an interesting thing to talk about because it's like, on one hand, religion provides this like amazing structure for being like a good human being. And mm -hmm. all, the, all the different religions in the world, whether it's even through like Greek mythology and everything, they preach similar meanings and stories. Don't be greedful, lustful, like all these similar ideas right. that I think just make you a good human being and trying to navigate that without picking one box to live in or or whatever you know and um i just think can be really difficult for a lot of people and mm -hmm. so to that point i don't i don't have that so for me searching for that moral ground searching for that that meaning has been tricky um and ironically it's the similar message you know i'm gonna help thy neighbor or whatever the mm -hmm. quote is <laughs> yeah. you know like i'm i'm and that's kind of where i've flipped it now is it's like I'm okay not having all the answers, you know? And I've been spending a lot of time trying to listen more to um, the world around me and, and, and listen more to like, what is making me happy? It's not just volleyball. Like what about it? Like the pro along the way, like what things do, or do make me really feel fulfilled? And for a long time, I was like, well, smoking weed makes me feel good or doing this makes me feel good. Like going out and hanging out with friends and partying a little bit makes me feel good. And as I've gotten older, it's been like, dude, if I, like post some like workout thing on Instagram and some club team or whatever, they start doing the warm up or one of the kids reaches out to me and they're like, dude, I, I love your videos. You've been so inspiring, whatever. Like, can you help me? I had a shoulder thing and like, I get to help some kid. I'll send, I send voice messages to everyone because I'm a terrible typer. Um, 
it just takes too long for me. I like mm-hmm. to talk. And I've just found recently, like, it's so fulfilling to be like, wow, I can help some kid in Thailand. Mm-hmm. Or I, this kid who reaches out to me from uh, Tanzania. And like, just people like that, where it's like, wow, I never would have thought that you could impact someone's life from across the world. I never thought that like, my social media presence really meant anything more than like, you know, I just want to joke around and fuck around about the world around me and express myself like that. And now it's been like, wow, I can actually like help change lives and do something good. And even having just that has given me enough feeling of like, okay, I, maybe I don't want to be a coach. Like I don't want to coach a, a club team or yeah. like, you know, it's like the very typical thing to do is play professionally or play in the university and then totally. go be a coach. And I was like, I got to do something extra unique or, yeah. you know, extra me and whatever. Um, but all that now it's like, I don't look at it like that anymore at all. It's, I look at it now, like, okay, how can I use who I am? Like authentically be myself and tell my story. And, and if people are attracted to that, like, how can I give back to that community of people? Mm -hmm. And it's just been like such a a powerful experience. Um, like I hate to say Instagram has been a powerful experience, but that's like my mode of, of transportation here, you know, of transferring my message or or trying to connect or give back to the community. And I just can't believe what an impact it's had already on people's lives, but also my own, mm-hmm. you know, and, and in my search for my continued search for meaning, you know, and I think like, that's been my biggest lesson is like finding ways to give back. And so when I feel depressed or angry or whatever, it's like, how can I try to funnel that into finding real meaning and make it, if I know this thing makes me feel really fulfilled, like, reach out to someone who reached out to you before Mm -hmm. or check in with people you love or like those things just make such a big difference that you know a younger version of me like couldn't navigate you know there's so many easier uh effort more effortless methods of navigating you know those states of mind so yeah i think i think the like as as you talked about earlier how communities are kind of not not devolving but i would say deteriorating because of covid and our unaccessibility to each other i think at the same time so many people are on these forms of social media that like it's it's creating lots of communities in a lot of different ways and i when i when i was younger i kind of thought i went through a phase where i was like social media is the devil totally sucks phones are the worst i'm there with you buddy i've deleted instagram twice yeah, I, I delete it all the time like I, like even <laughs> off my phone i'll i'll post something and it, it's tough when you get intertwined with it through like, like like what you're doing where you're putting yourself out there and you're helping people through it. It's tough because it becomes this kind of syzygy of like, this thing's bad. Whoa, this thing's really great. And so I think it's opening people's eyes to how can, how can this thing be great? How can we, like, it's a tool. It really is a tool and you can use a hammer to build a house or you can use a hammer to smack yourself in the head a hundred times. And with phones and Instagram and social media, um, so this is something that I'm doing, for example, is I'm slowly putting video together of me learning to walk again. And it's my goal to, to post that somewhere where people can access, because I don't think I can't find uh, a large database of easily accessible information on Achilles ruptures and learning how to walk after an Achilles rupture. And I find that very frustrating. So what I'm doing this time, because sure. I've already done this before, I'm trying to do this without a physiotherapist and really learn my body and learn how it works. And I read tons of papers and watch tons of videos on what other people are doing. And I'm trying to find a way that I can give back to that community and like not just people who have ruptured an Achilles, but mm. people who have twisted an ankle and people that are older that twist ankles, it's hard for them to get back into it. So, so, so it can be this tool for, for real good, like for really doing amazing things in the world. And I think that when you've tapped into that as, as someone who consumes information, like my girl, my ex-girlfriend was really good at this as she, her uh, TikTok was like totally curated to positive lifestyles. Like it was all mental health talks and learning how to do all these, all these new skills and textiles and sewing and pottery work. And so I think that it can be this tool that people use where it brings communities together and enables us to support each other in a healthy way rather than this constant back and forth battle of Instagram's evil and it's an escape because I think something that I actually realized that I do in in states of sadness and uh, I would say maybe non-desirable emotional states is I I reach for my phone and I I really have to be conscious about 
stopping myself and saying, hey, experience this. You're sad right now. You're angry right now. Get off your phone. Sit down and just feel this. Just bathe in this, this emotion. Let your, let your brain bathe in this and don't try to introduce anything else that's going to um, break up that experience. Just, How do you find that works for you? Uh, it sucks. Like, honestly, it, it's... No, I mean, like, how good... How, how do you find yourself navigating, like, holding yourself accountable for that? Uh, and by that, I mean, like... Because mm -hmm. I, I also, you know, have some similar tendencies where, like, for example, I have a hard time... Some, I'm not someone who really structures... I don't work well with structure yeah, <laughs> and planning I'm, I'm things out. I'm much yeah. more of a just kind of on-the-fly kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but, you know, recently I've been having taking on a lot more responsibility and feeling like I don't have time to do things and then trying to reassess where I can actually find time to do some of these things I want to do. And uh, I had my mom, who's also like happens to be a life coach, who was uh, like, you should start writing things down and like planning out the day. And I was like, you know what I should like, I should start holding myself accountable for the things I want to do. Mm -hmm. I did it for one day, bro, one day and was just like, I'm not I'm the guy who doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear you talk about that, like trying to change that habit, to me, I'm just like, oh man, how, that sounds like a, um, taking like the moral high ground of being like, I know this isn't good for me. I'm just going to sit here and feel these emotions. Mm -hmm. But like, how do you, what's that, that, uh, that power of will? Like, how do you hone into, to changing that kind of habit? Like, so what do you find is helpful? I, I, I think it's a really, um, it's, it's almost reactionary. It's almost a reflex. So there's this book called Behave by Robert Sapolsky. And he talks about how in a later chapter, he, he discusses what reflexes are and how doing the right thing. Like if you see, if you see someone drowning, like if you're in a pool and someone's drowning, like you'll see someone jump in. Or if you see someone roll their ankle, someone will get out of the crowd and run over and help them out. Um, my coach in Denmark was someone that was really good at that. And like someone, uh, what'd she do? She dislocated her pinky and like, he has, he has no, no stake in the matter at all. She's from another team, different city, whatever. And he just goes down and pops it back in. And then a week later, someone blew their ankle in our gym and, and he, he ran out. He was the first one there. He was helping her out. He was elevating and keeping pressure and everything. And, and it's a, I think it's a reflex, but I think it's a reflex that you need to train just like anything else. Our brains have the potential and the capability to, to alter how we think about the world and how we do and how we react. And most people that dive into those, those situations, it's a reaction. And I think that first it's hard to learn because you actually have to push yourself into doing it because it's out of your comfort zone. It's not something that you would do as a reaction, but over time it, be, it becomes a reaction. And this is something that's a little bit, different and kind of weird but it'll as as you change that as you do things differently your dreams will change in my experience so when I was after I ruptured my Achilles and I, I kind of I had a girlfriend and we broke up and then I, I I didn't hook up with a girl for almost two years mm. like it was just it, it was this change in my head that I went I don't like, I don't I don't really want to go home from a bar with some girl and hook up with her I want to actually have like an experience with someone and sometimes a girl and I would go home from the bar and we would honestly just cuddle or I would sleep on the couch we would hang out a little bit and then but like I, I didn't hook up with a girl for two years because it wasn't in it didn't make my conscious feel good after the fact I would I would feel bad um I don't like not calling people or anything like that so I just completely removed it and then in dreams that I would have I would do the same thing where I would like push girls away if they tried to make a move on me Mm. And and so I think that it's something that may be hard initially, but over time it becomes easier and easier and more reactionary. And so like like the phone thing, the I subconscious is a mother. Of oh, it's so crazy! Like the the amount of I think and I think it's it's weird because the amount of control that we have once we make that conscious, then then we really kick ourselves all the time because you're like, oh, I like, I know that I'm doing this bad thing. And then there there's sometimes where I have dialogues with myself where I'm like no, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm doing it anyways. I'm doing it anyways. And then, and I think over time it gets a little bit easier to avoid doing that thing where you know that you're like, uh, 
Al Alan Watts does a really good job at explaining this, but he says that everyone's an embroiderer. Dude, I love Alan Watts. I go down the rabbit hole with that guy all the time. The man is an absolute wizard, and mm. I can't get enough of him. All of his books are super great. But he, he has a lecture where he talks about embroidery and how people are more or less embroidery. On the front, we're very, very beautiful. We, and it's this, this Jungian idea of a persona. This is how we portray ourselves to the outside world. And then on the other side, there are all these shortcuts, and it's discolored and... And he talks about like, like you sweep stuff under the rug as a person. You're you're not doing the right thing all the time, but once you once you're consciously aware that you're not doing the right thing all the time, and you're being a rascal, then you're able to actually transform that and incorporate doing the right thing all the time into your conscious realm. Like once you've made that area of your mind conscious that you know that you're not doing the right thing. Okay, well now that you know that you're not doing the right thing, then you can start doing the right thing. And once you've done the right thing for a while, then it becomes reactionary. And, and I, I think that that's my long-winded answer to that question is that it starts off being really tough. And then over time, it gets a little bit easier. And even as it gets easier, maybe it's still difficult mentally to not do that thing. Like, in, for my example, I, I really think that people should have the opportunities to explore their sexuality. And I don't shame anyone for hookups or anything like that. It's just, it's just not something that I can do and, and be okay with myself on a daily basis. I think that I, I realized that as I was younger and growing up is that I, I need some kind of connection with someone to, to have that intimate relationship. And it, it, it would just kill me for like weeks on end. Like I couldn't stop thinking about it. It destroyed me. You know, it's, it's so interesting because when I, when I hear you talk about that, to me, it's like, yeah, I, I call it like sometimes I have to play dad with myself. Yeah. You yes. know? And uh, like, for example, <clears throat> You know, the way I, I had habitually trained in high school was like, finish school, like went to school, finished homework, uh, finished volleyball. Now I'll go smoke weed with my friends. And yeah. now I can go like, when it, when it came to, you know, three hours before bed and I have nothing to do, my day is done. Like, I didn't know how to just like sit there and hang out or watch a movie and just chill. It was like, I had to be like, have that thing that just like got me out of my head. Because I'm chronically someone who, I hate saying I'm a chronic overthinker, but I'm a chronic thinker, let's say, mm -hmm. as we all are, obviously. But yeah. I, I have that tendency that I love going really deep in conversation with myself, with others. And uh, so, so I liked, I, the reason I liked, you know, psychedelics other than just when you're young, you just want to get high and it's fun and it's new and whatever. Mm -hmm. But as I got, uh, you know, a, became a little more mature, is it like it was a tool for, um, getting me out of my own head mm -hmm. and so now that I've you know I'm with the national team now and I'm playing professionally and um that's not an option it's been like okay can we came home from training everything's done seven o'clock made dinner seven to ten I've trained myself for years that that's the time I go do my thing and, and leave my brain and, and think in a different way and have a different perspective and and now it's been like we're gonna just watch a movie sober mm -hmm. And we're just going to, you know, or like, yeah. and it sounds so silly, but it's so crazy to be like, so what I've noticed is, for example, if I get two, three days off, mm -hmm. um, I can't give myself too much, not leisure time or free time, but what I, what I find is most beneficial for me in understanding that my reflex when free time is around is like, oh, I'm going to go like, go grab a drink or go smoke some weed or go do this thing. Like mm -hmm. go escape basically yeah. because I, or with friends or whatever. And again, I don't want to say. The, 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 that's not that that's a terrible thing to do but i am saying that like when it becomes this this reflex it needs to be to have the awareness to be like all right is this like a healthy reflex for me mm -hmm. and how often do i use it and mm -hmm. so to me when it's like well when you spend years of your younger life making that your reflex and now all of a sudden those things aren't available to you you can't expect then that because you didn't have good enough moderation when you were younger you can't mm -hmm. expect that all of a sudden now you're overseas and you're alone and you're just like oh three hours before bed like oh, i'm great i'm just gonna read a book mm -hmm. you know like there's so yeah. many times i catch myself being like i know what i could or should do but for some reason i'm struggling to just like do what i know i should do and it's taken me so long and i'm still navigating you know i still it's become less and less and less and less but i'm still navigating how to subside those feelings and something that to me is where i, where I said was saying playing dad with myself has been to be like okay don't like pack your day with things and if you have that moment you know you're gonna have three hours whatever like call someone you love 
Mm -hmm. and just like talk to your girlfriend for a couple hours talk to like a buddy you haven't i mean dude i spent all my conversations via the phone because i'm halfway across the world from the people i love so it's like calling that buddy i haven't called in a while or having that project kind of set in stone and get forcing myself to learn how to edit video or learn how to do different things and uh yeah, I just thought, I don't know, when I heard that, I was like, man, that, like, learning to train that reflex in order to change a habit um, can be really difficult, and I know for myself, like, I'm still learning how to change some of those habits to have better moderation and balance in, in my own life, you know? Mm -hmm. I, uh, it, it's interesting because I think that weed is a really misunderstood drug. I did a, I did a podcast with a professor that I had written a few papers for on the negative effects of marijuana. And I think one of the most negative things about it is, is generally that people don't think it's addictive. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it's physically addictive, like there's not a huge withdrawal, but, but I think it's psychologically one of the most addictive things because a lot of people use it as mm -hmm. some kind of amplifier. Like it's used to amplify situations like, oh, before I eat this thing, I'm gonna get stoned. Before I watch this show, I'm gonna get stoned. Like it just, you don't need it to enjoy something, but you want it to enhance that experience. And I think, I think that people really get in the throes of it when, like you said, when it becomes reactionary and it's this reflex that you want it, it it's kind of this weird transition between like, I control this thing, I use this to change my state of mind and think differently, and it's a tool to whoa this thing has me now like i don't i'm not controlling this this thing and that's, controls me dude and that's the point i think is to not be then codependent on that thing to enjoy right. food or to enjoy and that's where I, I completely agree with you is it um physiologically or psychically like psycho what's the word i'm looking for Psycho psychologically addictive right. mm -hmm. that's for science to determine but mm -hmm. the real question is like <clears throat> how does that change based on like how do you use it and so if you're constantly using it as just like all the time because why not because you can and then all of a sudden like now you can't because i i have had friends who who to that point like if we're gonna go out and eat or we're gonna go to the movies it's like they, they needed that amplifier yeah you know and now all of a sudden you don't have that balance and that moderation like it becomes a problem mm -hmm. and um yeah, and I, yeah, I, that's, sorry, I just want, I think that's really interesting. No, no, I think that's a really good point. And I, I think that in line with that is that it, it doesn't become something that you use to escape. It becomes you. Like, it really becomes people. People become it, I would say, more so in that, like, I, I have friends that wake up and smoke a joint, mm -hmm. lunch and smoke a joint. Like, you're always under the influence of this thing, and you're always kind of chasing it, but, but you, your conscious state of of being sober is the high at some point because that's because what what i mean what so from a from a more chemical perspective i would say that like you smoke thc it hits your your cb1 receptor and then and then that's where you are and you're you're using it to elevate yourself you're using it to get high and you're considering waking conscious state of being sober as a low and you're always chasing this. And, and there, there are really good things about being sober. And like you said, how you're able to, like you're not escaping from emotions and a lot of that stuff. It's, it's more of a, I wouldn't say it's a real world because they're both equally real, but it's, it's a sober state where you can deal with these things that you maybe can't deal with at this state. And people are constantly at this state and, and this place kind of freaks them out. They're like, you're, you're, you get Jones in for a high. And I think that's what, mm -hmm. that's what addiction is. And, and I do think that, that their marijuana is a lot more psychologically addictive than people give it credit for. Hmm. Yeah. And I think the real message too, is some of that is their tools and yeah, they're used absolutely. to be as such. And then if you can't, and that's, so that's kind of like what I've taken. I, I have um, a really addictive personality mm -hmm. and, and that's to anything. And what I've realized is not just like, you know, I was addicted to weed. I wouldn't say I was addicted to weed, but like looking back on it, you could you could analyze and be like, yeah, he was addicted to smoking four eight all the time and doing all those things when I was a lot younger. Mm -hmm. um, but that that went into everything, and in, in some ways, like that's why I'm playing professionally now because right. I got addicted to the process of being an athlete. I loved because I saw such a huge change in what it did 
for my body, like physically, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I mean, yeah, I was tall and like pretty good volleyball player, but I was not a natural jumper. I was not this like super strong cut genetic freak kind of guy that I have friends who jump 40 inches who barely like don't do anything in the weight room, you know? Right. And uh, because it had such a huge impact on me, I got addicted to being like, oh shit, two months in, I can like see one more of my abs and like, I feel stronger. And I put a couple inches on my vert and I got like, when I get addicted to something, I get full on like all about it. And that's been with relationships with women. That's been with everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And now it's that ability to have that awareness of like, okay, I know this habit about myself that realistically is probably going to be around, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the question becomes, how can I use it to help me? And it's the same idea with, um, you know, psychedelics or marijuana, it sounds like too, where it's like, it can be a tool. Mm -hmm. If you can use it responsibly and let's say legally and, you know, if it, it's the, the culture around it is changing a bit, but I agree with you. Um, where it's not to be misunderstood that it's just it's like oh it's non-addictive and like you know it's just for yeah. fun and whatever it's like it can be mm -hmm. but it's like everything else in life you know like going out and getting having a pizza and a couple beers with your friends like can be a, a great thing a great mm -hmm. thing and I mean that in the sense that like having that time to just be free and just relax and you're with the people you love and you're eating shit food and you're drinking something that's not good for you like okay is it gonna kill you no but the problem is, well, that felt really good. Now let's do it tomorrow or the next day. Or like now I'm doing it three times a week. Or now I'm eating fast food all the fucking time. Or whatever it is. Like we all have our vices, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think for myself, it's been like, okay, I have this habit that I get, or habit. I have this, um, this part of me that really clings on to things that I like. It's like I wanted to be, I started to do, like I told stand-up comedy, I was like, I want to write. So I started writing a ton and doing all this research and like so into it. I'm like fucking Two weeks in, I'm telling my friends, like, dude, I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm getting paid to do it now, basically. You know, like, that's how into it I was. Yeah. And the same with, like, I had a best friend, Ben Patch, who was a photographer. Mm -hmm. And I would, when I was really searching for what I want to do outside of volleyball, I was like, oh, my best friend's a really well-known photographer. I'm going to go do shoots with him and did second shoots for some weddings and just, like, watching and learning how he uses Lightroom, like, learning all these things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, yeah, I just realized, like, oh, man that worked for like two months and then two months into it, I'm like, ah, I'm going to go serve or like, just play all of like, you know, I just like, I, it's just like this getting super into something. And then, and so now it's been like trying to teach myself to get addicted to things that are positively going to benefit me in the long term, mm -hmm. And that's uh, so much harder to do. <laughs> you know? It's, it's like, it's tough, so yeah. much harder to do that, dude. It's so much easier to like have a glass of, I live in France. Dude. I, should have a I should be drinking a glass of wine every night. You know what I mean? Yeah. France, yeah. The wine's amazing here. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. But like, I don't because it just takes me longer to recover or like, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, but also being like, I do need those times because if you try to change everything in one day, you get overwhelmed and nothing really changes. So it's a part of it for my balance has been like, okay, I get really addicted to things. How can I use this to my advantage? How can I use this to further down this path that I want to go down? And then also, what do I need to avoid to know that when I get in this situation, I'm going to have a tendency to do this thing, mm -hmm. you know? And like trying to navigate that has just been like, honestly, a lot of fun. And, and through, a lot, through that also like a lot of, you know, pain to, mm -hmm. to learn how to like <laughs> be sober every night. Yeah. Like I, I it's... You know, I, I like a lot of this people don't really know about me. You know, I don't, I mean, I'm also like really transparent and honest as well, but some of the stuff like being on the national team, it's hard. So like, this has been a cool talk so far, just because like, I don't get to, um, there's not a good outlet. People don't ask these kind of questions, aren't interested in this as much as like, oh, volleyball specific, everything. Yeah. Um, and this is a much more real side of like human beings in general, you know? So that's the goal, brother. Yeah. Right. I, uh, I'm. I think, I think something, so like on that kind of tangential kind of here, but also where you just were, you, you talked a lot about how, um, in not today, but elsewhere, um, your experience of kind of going up at U Hawaii, where you'd wake up at 6am and you'd go to work out and then you would go, I think it was like practice and then you'd go surf and then you would work out and it was just like this constant movement and 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 recently in the 
um, Andrew Huberman talks about in this podcast, and I, I need to actually find the source and look into this because I, I like to vet stuff after I've heard it. I like to kind of make sure that it's all like I don't I don't distrust that guy at all. He's a total genius, and I think that he's definitely onto something. Um, but there's this. So he talks about the. So there's there's an inner inner ear fluid in your in your ear canal. Uh, I think it's like they refer to it as the vestibular. And so it's this it's this circular tube kind of where there are all of these calcium bones more or less they're uh yeah yeah that's probably that's probably the best way to put it um you can make something up at this point yeah exactly yeah i I don't want i don't want to go too far into it i (laughs) i think i like to keep it kind of it's cool though i I appreciate it but um so by by moving these around it puts our body into stress and it arouses us and then that opens up a pathway to neuroplasticity and so with your with your addiction it kind of becomes this positive feedback loop where like you love working out you love moving and then that increases the potential for neuroplasticity because that increases that increases arousal and so with you constantly moving and with you constantly doing all these different things the way that you exercise your body and like you're constantly moving so with so with those calcium bones activating and 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 those control balance as well so that's that's kind of the crux of my thought experiment right now that I'm, I'm working through is that your ability to move around and the exercises that you do where you're constantly moving, practicing headstands, doing, being in positions that aren't natural to people or that we don't do as much since we're not playing as much and moving around as much. The way that you exercise is really play. And I think that that's really cool because that increases the capacity for, for neural change. And I wonder if that had a huge positive, it sounds like it had a huge positive feedback loop on the way that you learned to be addicted to the right thing because you were moving in these ways that your body went, Whoa, this is good. I'm getting endorphins and there's dopamine and there's this constant positive feeling while I'm exercising and I can sustain that. And me moving in these ways actually amplifies my ability to, to do those things. That that's a really, that's a really cool point, man. And, and I think to that, I think of two things. And the first is, um, yeah, for me, I think why I uh, I didn't just fall in, in love with the movement stuff. It didn't just work for me because of the physical changes I saw in my body and the the mental changes, the mental clarity that I was getting. And the, um, obviously, like we had already talked about, you know, if you go for a jog or do whatever for 30 minutes, like you just your uh, state of consciousness changes mm-hmm. through physical activity. And um, it wasn't just that. It was also it got me out of my own head. And what I realized is if I get as much as I love being alone and internalizing, if I get too much time, it can become a a self deprecating thing, you know, and it became, can become more of a, a a negative thing. And so I realized that, well, if I can keep myself moving, it keeps me out of my head. One of the biggest reasons I love surfing Mm -hmm. is because in those moments, like really it's about like how many, how many things can I, how many things a day, can I do that can put me in a, in a flow state, mm-hmm. you know, in that ability to be thinking about nothing and thinking about something at the same time. Yeah. And that's why I love activities like surfing. It's why I like, I love volleyball still. It's like when I'm in the volleyball gym for the most part, I'm not thinking about anything else. Mm-hmm. My, what happened to me outside of volleyball with relationships or whatever. It's like when I'm playing volleyball, it's like in that moment, I'm just there. And what I found is like, well, the, the second part is like, I got, <laughs> I re- I realized how important it was for me when I had knee surgery and couldn't move around as much and realized like, wow, my body became so physically dependent on exerting itself every day. Mm-hmm. Like, so, so, I'm sorry. So just in general dependent on it. And when I stopped like coming home tired and when I spent most of my day in my bed, like I got like internally itchy. Mm-hmm. Because I had spent most of my life being so active, and to your point, like playing. Yeah. Because I was so, I, I because I fell in love with the process of, um, like physical training outside of just volleyball specific training, and had met so many unique minds along the way. Um, I, I had all these like different tools in my bag, and a, and a big part of something that, for example, um, Austin Einhorn, who's with Team Apiros. 
um, he really, pre his, he's got kind of more of like an evolutionary standpoint on, on training. And that is, I just think is like, <laughs> I think he's a genius. Mm -hmm. Like I, I really do. I think that what he's doing right now is so incredible and I'm so honored to have got to work with him and still have such a good relationship with him. But a big what, thing what he preaches is, like? what's that? What does that look like? That training regime, that tra that training uh, It's a lot more like, um, climbing for example mm -hmm. we do a lot of like hanging a lot more like so we talk evolutionary uh, oh, cool. movements right. deep right. squat climbing that kind of stuff yeah um but a, a concept of his is you know like I, I i've worked with him for a little for like four or five years not really i haven't really got to work with him one-on-one -on -one in person for a lengthy period of time unfortunately mm -hmm. but even the few sessions we've had where it'd be like i just show up and it's like what do you want to do like what a fucking question for a trainer to ask you, what do you want to do? It's like, you know, we're so used to showing up and being like, okay, my whole life has been structured for me. You know, mm -hmm. I go to practice and like, I don't get to structure it, unfortunately, <laughs> but I, you know, like I show up and it's like, it's already structured for me. There's mm -hmm. no just like fit into it, you know? And it's yeah. the same with like strength and conditioning. We're always looking for like, how do I do it? Just tell me, dude, I get questions like that all the time. I'll put I, like some of the stuff I've posted, honestly, in my opinion, is fucking gold. Yeah. Like a lot of the stuff I think I've been posting is like, you're not, I'm not teaching you how to do a basic squat or how to do like, you know, some things you can go on YouTube and find, like I'm teaching people things that I learned that had a huge impact on my life and right. that were fun and different than what you're used to seeing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I just think he, he had much more of a, um, this, this standpoint of like being a guide and not necessarily, I think so many, what I'm learning right now also is like teaching is such a skill. Mm -hmm. And um, I think so much I can imagine being a parent and like your kid falls and you want to pick them up and you're, you're being a coach and like watching a, you know, 17, 16 year old boy, like play volleyball. It's like, I could probably give him a thousand things, like little technical things to help him. Mm -hmm. What you don't realize is like, how do we learn best? Like figuring it out on our own. Mm -hmm. And yet we've now started this, like created this society that's really like the best restaurant to go to or the, the, yeah. the fastest way to put 20 inches on your bird or whatever. And kids are looking for these like shortcuts and I don't fucking blame them. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I was saying, like the question I get the most is how can I hit harder? How can I jump higher? And so I'll post these like shoulder, these different things and people will still send me like, oh, but how many reps are you doing? Instead of just like, what if I told you to do a hundred reps? You do 20 and be like, ah, I fucking 20. That's all I can do. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, do three sets of that. Yeah. And then next week do, you know, I don't know, two sets of 25 or 20. Like, you know, there's so many, but I want that. I think people need to understand that. Like you need to take some ownership. And, and it's so cool to hear you say like, I'm going to figure out my, like, I'm going to rehab almost myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that you're doing research and you're not just like waking up every morning and going to figure it out. Like, well, but, like, I walk in the day. Yeah. Dude, yeah, but I mean, like, there's something cool about that, you know, of like, it's mm -hmm. sad that it's almost been like a lost art of like, coming to your own conclusions and understandings through your own experience. Mm -hmm. And if you can take that into other areas of your life, I, it's so much more fulfilling. I know it. You learn so much more about your body from, from that failure. So you learn so much more about how many reps do I need to do from trying to do 100 and failing at 20. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and learning to create, then it gives you the tools to create on your own, which is why I've been now able to create a lot of the things on my own is because I had learned from people who give, who gave me a structure and some that looked different for, for some of them. Um, but now I've kind of like taken the things that I liked from all these different gurus, let's say, and mm -hmm. I've created what I think is my own, like, resiliency, volley resiliency crack package or whatever yeah. for myself, the shit that I do now. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't have someone writing me up stuff. It's like, I have a general idea of things to do now because I've spent time researching and spent time like learning and failing and wanting to put inches on my vert and plateauing and like being like, how's this all work? Like trying to figure it all out. It takes years to figure out. Um, and so it's like, man, it doesn't surprise me when I see um, these kids who, but you know, then they, they're doing like, I see all these kids doing like box jumps and doing all this stuff where it's like, okay, there's a, there's like a, that's a, that can be a great thing. Learning to do some basic like strength and conditioning kind of Olympic style lifting, like it, everything has its place. Mm -hmm. But this like, and this is where like to bring it back to like what Austin's doing with the Pyrrhus is it's much more of this standpoint of like, um, come and create, mm -hmm. come and play, like 
like imagine rather than um you know showing up and working out like doing some strict workout by like a, your strength and conditioning guy for an hour but getting the same results from doing something where you showed up and you were just like all right i'm going to try to do this line on the rock wall or i'm going to try to like we have like an emphasis on something and we're going to find ways to play and we challenge each other like like that's the big thing and and so i get that you know not everyone has a rock ball a but i get that like you know people especially now in quarantine are much more um you know isolated mm -hmm. and that's again bringing it back to like where community is just like such a big point of emphasis for me now and how can you create that community when you're mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all alone and i'm trying to create this little bit this community and i use the catchphrase you won't all the time now because i think it's like such a cool way to like it's for me, it's like, that's how like my buddies and I spoke back in college, you know, I was like talking a little shit and like, that was the community and the culture we created to push ourselves to be the best version of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, yeah, I think having that sense of play and that looks different and, and I get it where it's like, some people need structure. Some people need, I need to do three sets of 20 and that's how they work best. That's great. Um, but having, so play could be to me, like play could be showing up and be like, all right, what do you want to work on? Mm -hmm. play could also be like showing up and this is what we're going to do but we're going to like push each other and talk shit and like you know like you, you figure out what works for you um but i do think that it's it's so funny even with like our structure here for volleyball it's like dude my coaches aren't gonna listen to this shit i hate our practices bro like yeah. for the most part i'm not a fan of the french style of training it seems to be a lot of like free attack a lot of you know like hitting lines kind of stuff basic right, surface yeah. stuff it's fucking boring. I've been doing this for 15 years, dude. I don't mm -hmm. want to like, I don't, like, I don't need free attack to be honest with you. I don't yeah. need to hit against nobody. I'm already doing great hitting against everybody, you yeah. know, like not to be cocky, but just being honest, like, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's so funny how the farther you go, there seems to be less and less of it. When you're mm -hmm. a kid, you know, you're 13, 14, 15, whatever. It's like, let's go have fun. Let's play on the beach. Let's do this. It's all for fun and play. And then you, the serious kids want to get serious. So they do the serious stuff. And they think it's going to work better for them. And the parents pay all this extra money to do all this serious stuff. And like, you don't realize that like, dude, there's actually talk about neuroplasticity. There's so much that comes from having that openness of like, of playing and enjoying something and how much more you actually get from it, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that seems to be like a real lost art in, in teaching and coaching uh, from what I've experienced. Um, luckily, I've got to experience on firsthand the people who I think exemplify a great example of what it looks like. Um, but from what I've seen on the other ends of things, it's like most people aren't that way. Yeah. And, uh, and that goes also for like people who work regular jobs, you know, I'm sure if you're working like a desk job nine to five, like it's probably not, there's probably not a lot of fun or play involved in your job, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, but I think finding ways to either create that or to build an environment where that becomes a majority of your life, I think is like, for me, the ultimate goal. And, and it's hard, you know, like it's hard when you're on a team, for example, to, and, and this is ironic because my job is literally to play, mm -hmm. but it also is a job, you know, like yeah, 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 yeah. at this level too, it's like, it's a fucking job, man. I got to show up and, and put in work for a couple hours. And some days I love it. And some days I hate it like everyone else for whatever else they do. And the times that I hate it, I try to, um, invent my own type of play in my mind. So for me, it could be like, you know, we're doing serve, serve and pass. And it's like, I basically serve a ball and wait a minute, a full minute for the next five guys to serve. And then it's me again and serving against the receivers. Mm -hmm. It's fucking boring, dude. You know? Yeah. And if I stand from the spot that I always do and I do my routine, it's like, I've done it a million times. And I'm not saying it's not important to do a million times. It is. But the way that I challenge myself now is like, I serve from every different spot on the court. Like if I'm jump serving, instead of just serving for that same spot, I serve from every little spot, like all over. And I face different directions. I'm doing different angles. And some people could be like, Oh, you're just fucking around. But to me, it's like, I understand the concept. The concept is the ability to step close and contact the ball in that same spot to drive the ball where I want to put it. That's right. the concept. Mm -hmm. So now if I can do that from anywhere on the court, it actually, makes me more well-rounded as a volleyball player mm -hmm. and so it's the same thing where like we do like free attack basically like hitting lines so rather than just like getting a super comfortable approach and just like walking into it and just bouncing the shit out of the ball which is super fun and easy to do mm -hmm. now it's like i force myself to like hang at the net 
as the ball's being tossed, transition really hard and go. Or put myself in positions where I'm like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my approach literally from – and luckily I'm on a team where I can kind of experiment a little bit because this is the things that I probably wouldn't maybe do with the national team at like that level. Mm-hmm. But where I, I, I do get a little bit of the ability to experiment with some new things to, challenge, to continue to challenge myself. And we, I think we need that. Mm-hmm. We need to be in an environment that's challenging us. And so if you can't alter the environment – the physical environment that you're going into, you have to find a way to alter the mental environment that's going on in your own head. Yeah. And that can be a lot harder to do, but um, yeah, I think that it's just like really that ability to, to adopt more of a playful mindset in a lot of things that you do really open up some doors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I, I coach, I had to explain this to this woman's team. So I coach a woman's team in Denmark and we had this really good relationship. I actually coached three teams. I was coaching a Div 1 team, a youth team, and then this Div 2 women's team. And they were the ones that I got along best with because I think they had the, far, the highest ceiling, but they were, they were on the floor. Like, they were way down here, couldn't really get any lower. I think they were bottom of the division. And I, I had to explain it to them because I, there may, maybe there was language barrier, but I, my whole thing is, like, I want you guys to fail. I, I don't want to go 13 and 0 this season. I don't want everyone to smash their serve every single time and make it every single time. I think that we have to fail to learn. And I, I had to explain it by using this, uh, there's this old Russian cognitive, psych- psych- cognitive psychologist named uh, Lev Yugovsky. And he developed this thing called the zone of proximal development. So in the middle of this zone is the things that you know and that you're capable of doing on your own. In a little bit farther out is the things that you're capable of doing with the help from someone else. And then everything outside of that is just things that you're incapable of. And I just like erased the line of the things that we're not capable of. It was like everything like we, we have the potential to do anything. And I want to give you guys freedom to go. Like if, if this is the, what the zone used to be, I want you guys to go there. I want you guys to go there. I want you guys to go there. I want you guys to have as much freedom as you'll take. Like we'd be in drills and they'd be like, Hey, are we supposed to be doing this? I don't know. Do you think it'll help? Yeah, I think it could help. Okay. Do it. Like I would have them spin serve. Some of them I think might still hate me because I would make them spin serve or try serves they weren't comfortable with. Like I was getting women to do like a float toss and hit a spin, which is something that I don't think is happening like anywhere really. And like doing, doing splotes and, and some of them like, hated it because they would mess up all the time, but then occasionally they would make it. And I wouldn't really give a lot of feedback. I'd kind of walk around the back line and occasionally say, hey, maybe you can get your arms back a little bit more. But mm. everyone knows the concept. Everyone knows what we're trying to do. And I think that so many coaches have this, this tendency, and not just coaches. I think people everywhere have this tendency to really put constraints on freedom. And, and it, I think that it inhibits growth. And with serve, I think serving is an interesting thing because by – forcing your team to spin serve you're not just teaching them how to serve you're teaching them how to approach faster and how to attack at a high angle so you're training all of these other movement patterns at the same time but i I really think that people putting these constraints like hey we're not doing this i had a conversation yesterday with eric lepke who's a canadian guy in italy right now but they started off the season doing the like full ingape side set and and their coach nuxed it after they messed it up a few times and 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 there are these i think coaches also we we've, we've defined it as the go- i've defined it as the golden eagle the golden eagle okay the that's, golden that's, eagle i've got a how to on my page of how to do the golden eagle no yeah. that's the only reason i bring that up is cuz dude that's to that point i mean that's the same on the national team i mm-hmm. don't i don't get a lot of those i'm much more in a box cuz we have a system with the national team that i don't feel the where i can really express myself and my own creativity Whereas, like, when I'm playing professionally overseas, I feel like I'm this completely different player because I get to be much more creative and I can take more – I can make more mistakes, you know, and have those failures even at a, at a high level. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do agree with you where I don't it, – dude, it, to me, it reminds me almost of, like, uh, private lessons. And there's this interesting thought of, like, giving a private lesson and not saying a lot. Like if I just put someone through drills that I knew would help them, that would focus on these concepts, whatever they may be. And I put them through for an hour, but I don't say much. Parents don't like that as much. Yeah. It's like parents get off to being in the fucking back of the room 
listening, you'd be like, hey, actually put your arm a little bit this way and put your hand up here. And like, they fucking love that stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's got me thinking like, if I do ever enter that kind of like mentoring, coaching kind of world, um, like where, where do you find the balance between like, you need to, you need to please them in the sense of like, we're going to do vertical training. But also you need to teach them like these are the concepts that will actually allow you to thrive and survive in the sport. Yeah. You know, Just like for me, I, I generally start my team initiation with telling people that they're not going to like me. Like, mm. Hey, you're probably not going to like me. Um, those of you who get better will probably like me less because I'll continue to push you. And the people that don't get better, I, I won't really talk to you because I think that, like seeing that positive feedback of someone, someone gets better. Like uh, there's this thing called the the Predo distribution where like there are people on my team where I'll talk to one person probably 80% of the time because they're the person that's continuously getting better. They're going to get a lot of feedback because they're, I'm, they're constantly getting better. They're constantly taking the feedback and there are people that I won't talk to super often because like, I say something to them and in one ear out the other. And for those people, what I'm waiting for is for the, the creativity and the positive feedback loop to start kicking in. Because I had one girl named Anna that she would serve under the net, under the net, under the net, and then occasionally hit one over the net. And then the next ball would be a good serve. And then I would go and talk to her, be like, how did that feel? I want to know how that felt. I want you to think about where your body was, where your mind was. And, and it's not just a physical rote learning of you have to rep this out a thousand times. Like you have to think about it. It's not just that that's essentially what we're doing when we're learning is approximating what works and what doesn't work. If something doesn't work, okay, I need to change something. And then doesn't work again. Okay, I need to change something. It works. Okay, what did I do? Like we need to be have this constant feedback loop in our minds and bodies. But yeah, I'll I'll even tell parents, like, hey, I'm you're you're probably not gonna like my philosophy. Some of you mm -hmm. are gonna just want results, you're gonna want your kid to to be playing all the time and like I, I really believe in uh, like a modified equal play as long as you're showing up all the time and I see you getting better and I see you making effort you're gonna play I'm not gonna sit you on the bench I don't care about championships I want personal development and mm. again another thing that happened with my girls team was that there was a there was a situation where they were kind of put into a tough spot they were gonna pull girls up from the youth team and put them onto my women's team and the youth team was gonna play over top of them in games and they were they were kind of like oh, okay like i i guess that's fine when they talk to the the club manager and then i kind of took them into a room and was like hey i'll like you guys let me know what you really want and i'll go to bat for you like i'm i'm not part of the organization i'm a coach for this team like i want to know what's best for you guys and i want you guys to get better at saying no to things if you don't like them like i don't want you guys to get stuck in that area where we're in a big group of people one person says yes so everyone kind of starts murmuring, yes, I want people to, or like I said earlier, step out of that zone and, and make moves that they're not comfortable with, but that they feel are the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, dude, I just like hear that and I'm like, that's like such a low percentage, percentage of coaches that I know. And that's really awesome that you're able to have that kind of self uh, that awareness to to coach like that and it's also like risky i'm sure on your end you know because it's oh, different yeah. than the the norm of coaching you know the normal yeah and, and that's what i mean by like i tell kids and i tell athletes and i tell parents like I, I started off by letting them know hey i coach in a very different way we're gonna mess up a lot you're not gonna be happy all the time you're gonna leave practice thinking that you did horribly because like you need to go home and sleep. And then that's when you like, that's when the neuroplasticity happens is in your first wave of sleep and your in your deep sleep. So like, you're going to, you're, we're going to fail a ton. You're going to go home. You're going to come back next week and you're going to be a little bit better than last time. And once you're a little bit better than last time, I'm going to push you a little bit more into a different direction and you're going to do bad. And, and I try to have a, a reasonable balance between we're doing bad and we're doing good with the knowledge that the more we do bad, the, the more we'll do good later. So, so I, I often kind of- It's just funny because that's, that's, kind of, that's such a hard thing for the girls and boys to understand and comprehend mm -hmm. at that age. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, that, so, and, that's, and that's why I say yeah. that's why it's tough. I tell other coaches, like I've, 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 I've head coached and with other assistant coaches, I've been like, you're not gonna like being here. Like I'll, I'll tell you right now. 
you're not going to enjoy being an assistant coach under me because at the end of the day, I'm going to call the shots. And I tell parents, hey, you're, you're, you might not like my philosophy. I tell kids, hey, you might not like my philosophy, but this is how we're doing it. And I think there's science to back it up. And I think well, that I challenge you to not word it that way every time, because I think <laughs> because your message is a positive, more fulfilling message. Mm -hmm. So that's my challenge for you is how can you word that in a way where it's, it's not just like, hey, I don't think you're going to like me, even though that may be the case, mm -hmm. um, because I think the world needs more of you, mm -hmm. you know, and not just as a coach, but just in general, like I think the world needs more people who have that. Um, that perspective and that train of thought. I think that in general, I, it's, it's this weird thing that I do where I like present myself in a way that I portray my idea that you're not going to like me. And then after a few weeks, the, like the kids are normally like, Oh, whoa. Like you, you get the, like I had a, in Kamloops, I coached a team. It was a U18 team and I had a 13 year old because the the levels the, like there just aren't enough kids to field a mm -hmm. full u18 team and a full u16 team and a full u14 team so i had this like 13 year old kid and at the start we were like i was getting him to spin serve and he's watching these 18 year old beasts that are like ripping on spin serves and he and the whole time he was like i'm not going to spin serve i can't spin serve and i pushed him to spin serve pushed him to spin serve pushed him to spin serve and he hated it and then finally he started making spin serves and getting aces and he became one of our highest efficiency players because he was always doing the thing that he could like he played his role so well in that he would find good tips he would find smart tips he would put the ball in play and the other team would mess it up and over time he, he started to love me and we developed this really cool relationship with each other because because he started off thinking i think that he started off in a place where he was like I don't like this guy. I'm not going to like this guy. And then when he started to succeed, there was a, there was an increase in positivity for his self image. And that was associated with the things that I had done to coach him. Sure. Which increased yeah. his perception of me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also being like, ah, I'm not that funny. And then like telling some story that's fucking hilarious, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe yeah. I love your strategy actually. Yeah. I, I, like I, it's a, it's a very Zen principle of no expectations. And often when you, when a new coach comes in, especially from my experience, if an international guy comes in or someone from, from high esteem, they have a, a really prestigious pedigree. They come into the gym and you go, Whoa, this guy's going to, this guy's going to change my life. This is going to be sweet. So I like to come in and I don't think that a lot of people have the ability to, to live in a, in a, in a world null of expectation. So I try to undershoot expectation. I'm like, this is going to suck. You're going to hate me. And then like, we're stuck together. So after a month, like you're going to figure it out. When did you really start adopting this more like Zen approach towards life? Is it, is it from your mom growing up with um, kind of just her influence in your life? Was it a trip to Asia? What, like, where did you start to uh, seek out um, knowledge from people like uh, Alan Watts and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff? So a really good friend of mine, a really big mentor, his name was Ken McLaughlin and he runs this pursuit volley page and everything. And he's a really good volleyball coach. And, um, it was the summer after my first year, I came out of the season, didn't do a lot and was like, I'm going to go get huge. I'm going to become this absolute monster and start next year. And then, so, so him and I were, we worked summer camps together and our boss was this, we, we referred to, so you know the feeling when you're driving through traffic and then you see a police officer off to your right, pull up to you at the stoplight and you're instantly like, oh geez, like there's a cop. You're not doing anything wrong, but there's this immediate feeling of anxiety. And mm -hmm. it's, it, I, I think it happens with coaches and bosses as well, where you're doing something, you're having fun, you see them out of the corner of your eye and you're like, okay, tip top, I have to be on my perfect behavior. So we were around this guy and... Uh, like the camp paid at the end of the summer and it was like a full summer gig. So I didn't have any money. And I think I went like four or five days without eating once because I, like I didn't want to ask people for money and I was super stressed and developed this kind of weird eating disorder where I couldn't really eat, but I was getting super skinny and super stressed and not eating enough. And, um, and one day we're, we're driving along and we're talking about all this philosophy stuff and he was really big into 
into Zen because I guess when he, when he was younger, he had a mental health crisis and his doctor kind of walked in the room and was like, Hey, this book helped me a lot. You should read this. And it's called Zen mind beginners mind by Shinra Suzuki. And that became my Bible for a long time. And, and during that, we talked about uh, Brett Walsh, who was a setter from the U of A that he mm-hmm. was really big into Watts. And so I kind of, I kind of followed into that and was like, Whoa, this is really sweet. This is cool. So I think that the, 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 my, my philosophical foundation is more or less Zen Buddhism because that's what I started with. And then I started getting into more European philosophy and like psychoanalytics and Nietzsche and Kant and a lot of that stuff. But I think my foundation is, is truly a very Zen philosophy. Hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm there with you. And I think a lot of times could use more. I remember my first years over, like I sitting right here, right next to me is a, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I don't know if you've yeah. read that book. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Fantastic book. Sometimes it's much over my head, but it's a great book. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I remember the same, like my just just getting out of college, and and I was really interested in guys like Carl Sagan, um, yeah. Alan Watts, those kind of thinkers, that type of thinker for a long time. Um, but dude, that that's how I spent like I feel like the first two years of my professional overseas life because you you get so much time as an athlete. You know, there's some days where three hours is really what my day calls of me. Mm-hmm. And then I have, you know, the whole morning or the whole six till I get home at six and then tell 11 or 12, like six hours to just like go on YouTube and listen yeah. to lectures. And um, yeah, I just, I was just curious because I think either for people listening and even for myself was curious about, you just seem like such a knowledgeable um, person. And in fact, I'm really envious of the way you, your ability to, uh, recall things from like books and you're you're using the the author's name and like quoting stuff like that's my biggest problem and probably stems from uh, all the good times i had as a young and that i feel like i have the fucking memory of a goldfish um but but yeah just that you just kind of sparked in me to remind myself to like um just to, to make sure that you don't lose sight of having some sort of practice and, and you can call it spiritual practice, whatever, but some sort of reminder and, and whether it's reading a little bit from that book or having some little thing um, is probably a great thing moving forward for a lot of people, for myself included. This is a big thing that I'll take away from this conversation, you know, is to make sure that um, like most things, you want to get good at volleyball and play volleyball every day. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to get more clear with your psychological understanding of how the world works or whatever, like, you need to feed that as well. You can't just like feed it for one year. And then yeah. Like it for, well, I think know. that's like where that came from. Like, like I said, when I was young, I was constantly told that I was stupid. I, I'm actually still um, like self-conscious of my intelligence. I don't think that I'm a super intelligent human being. I, I kind of, I carry that from being a young kid and being told consistently, like, you're not smart. You can't do this. I, I mm. basically scraped by high school. I think I got a 51 in math in my last year like I, I really my coach really pulled some strings to get me into university so I I my change was in my after I ruptured my Achilles it was the only time that I didn't have access to my body I never had a chronic injury before had never broken a bone tendon nothing I had some lower back problems but nothing that kept me out for longer than a week and and it just became this shift because like you said earlier whoa, my Achilles is the most important part of my body. Like the pinky is the most important part of your body when you don't have it. And I, I realized that I had neglected this, this thing on like between my ears for so long. And that was kind of this opportunity to dive into myself. And I really pushed out. I, I think I was really extroverted before that had happened. I was always talking to people. And even after I came back from my Achilles that, that summer after I traveled Asia, I would talk to some of my really close friends that I, that were, that were from school that weren't, that I wasn't communicating with during the time of Asia and Achilles. I came back and they were like, everyone thinks you're different. Like everyone thinks you're a totally different person because I really changed the things that I pulled worth from in being from external to internal. Like I started reading a ton and I had this friend, Randy, and he's this like English master, or uh, no, sorry, he did his major in English and his minor in philosophy. And the dude is just an absolute genius and reads a ton. And, and him and I would, we would watch a movie and it would take us four hours to watch an hour and a half movie because he would pause it and we would just talk about it, 
talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And so I started to hone in my ability to talk about things and think about things. And like we talked about earlier, it, it's a practice. It really is a practice. I used to say like a lot. Um, the first few episodes of my podcast, I refused to post. I deleted them because I said like so much and I wasn't citing things properly. And I probably said like a million times in this conversation. No, man, you, you, have, a, you have a very good vernacular. You're very, very articulate. I love listening to wow. you. So much fun. No, seriously, I, I've had such a good time during this. And even when I read, like when I pick up a book, I, I look at the book and I say the author's name a few times and then I dive into it because to me, I had a weird experience in my second year where I went to my, my head coach at the time and said, Hey, we're playing this team. They don't have a very good C ball hitter. I think our outside hitter should, we should step and do a push block. And so our outside takes the middle and our middle can stay in the middle and take the 30 or they can release. So we're essentially just trapping their left side and middle and leaving their outside alone. And him and I had some interesting experiences together, but he basically said, no, like, no, we're not going to do that. I don't think that's a good idea. We're never going to do that on this team. I said, oh, okay, fine, whatever. Um, and then the next day we came into practice and, and, and I forget, I forget, like, I obviously, I don't know exactly how he worded our memory is super fallible, but I come into practice and we start working on this push block. And he's like, I've had this idea, guys, we're going to work on this push block. And it was exactly what I said. And I remember just being so frustrated by, by, by my, my information not being acknowledged. So then after that, I developed this really weird kind of complex where I want to acknowledge people's ideas. Like if I'm talking about something and it's not in the, the realm of common consciousness, like if, if people don't talk about it in regular conversation, like I, I try to acknowledge the author or to cite whatever paper. And I don't do it all the time. It's, it's really hard to do it but I've, I've made it a, I'd say a concerted effort to do that more often. That's really cool. Something I should probably consider, honestly. <laughs> Take it it's, yeah, it's hard. I mean, dude, sometimes it's, but it's true. It's like, how many movies? I'm like, that was an amazing movie. It's like, I don't even fucking know who directed it. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I think that ability, that especially I think when you get older and you realize how hard it is to do things, mm -hmm. how hard it is to master things. You know, and like looking at movies now and being like, wow, someone took this story out of fucking thin air. I mean, this type of movie, let's say out of thin air, made up a right. story, made up a plot that has meaning and makes me feel a certain type of way. It made me engage and think deeply into my own life. And they use these actors who were able, who were just fucking people pretending to be other people, you know, like, and, and, and they found a way to like position them and get resource the actors and special effects, do all these kind of things to make these incredible feature films. And now it's like, we have people who are like, ah, oh, that movie suck. Mm -hmm. and it's like, a, you know, like just some of that things where it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just realizing like, man, writing a book, how mm -hmm. fucking hard it must be to write a book. I'm actually like currently working on a course. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been, learning as well how hard it is to to write i've been writing out a script for this course and just um you know realizing how hard it is to take my own thoughts and articulate them not just on paper but then redefine them so they're easily digestible so people can understand them mm -hmm. and even that process alone is like for me i found so difficult and then on top of that finding your own voice within that you know because right. i think like when I first started writing the script, it was like, all right, all the things I know about this one topic and I would just kind of fart all over the page. And then I'd like chop it up and be like, okay, this is what I'm trying to say. And then I'd get a little lost or whatever. And then I'd read it out loud and be like, this sounds like I'm fucking in fifth grade reading an essay to the class, you know? Like, yeah. I need to speak like, yo, what's up? Come to my house, and check out my crib and fucking, I'm gonna teach you some shit, you know? Like that's how I, that's my personality. That's how I need to right. portray what I'm, what I'm trying to, to write and talk about. And just how that in general, like the ability to communicate is such an art form, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and the, the, the point that I was really trying to make is like, I think it's so important to give credit to things like that. You know, I have a, I have a brother who's a professional songwriter in LA and he's just having him as a brother had made me more aware to being like, oh, who wrote that song? Or who, and I, I come from a very musically inclined family. So that, that side is always like, oh, it's really interesting. Who produced that album? Mm -hmm. or you know just different like really trying to give credit to people in this understanding like that shit is hard 
Not yeah. that that shit entertained me and I was grooving for, you know, three minutes or it made me feel a type of way. That's all great. That's the purpose. That's how, that's the communication of music. But on the other hand, giving credit to someone and being like, wow, a human being like made that, you know, mm -hmm. like music's its own like beast yeah. to be able to um, not just make music out of thin air and, and, and frequency, but also the ability to then portray a message through using different um, metaphors or however you choose to, to speak in music. It's just like, you realize that to really master something takes so long. I mean, podcasting is a great example. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to get better at podcasting. I'm sure you just need to do it a hundred times. And the first three times you don't post it because you hear these, like you saying like all the time, you know, yeah. I can only imagine it. And so my point is, I think, and this just comes, I think with age as well, is just realizing how hard it is to be a master at something. Mm -hmm. and how important it is to give credit where credit is due yeah. and and that taking the little bit of time to understand a, a film um and to really take what maybe that because that's what's so funny i think i can only imagine when you're when you're directing a film or when you have an idea for a film it's like you have the idea and then you're like what's the deeper meaning the deeper story the deeper message and that gets there's little things that get put in all throughout the movie but when you're just like a kid watching a movie or or an adult just like watching a movie you just want to be entertained or something you know and you're not seeing all the like little bits of beauty that go through all the all the real thought like human thought that went into producing a film and i just i just think that that stuff is so beautiful like that there everything is in in some way an art form to really master that yeah. um and i just think that's that's really cool and it's it's got to be so hard for a lot of people it's got to be so overwhelming because we live in a, in a world of, of instant gratification, you know, mm -hmm. and how hard that is, I think for some. And so to, even to bring back to your point of like coaching, how hard it is, where it's like, I just want to hit harder or I, I suck at the serve today. Like, I don't want to like, you know, yeah. And I, I can only imagine how much more difficult it's ironic that we have more resources than ever, more positive resources to handle these types of emotions, to guide people in a positive way through their lives. And at the same time, it's like the most interesting generation to like try to preach uh, Zen concepts to, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that, that's gotta be, I don't know. That's gotta, I can only imagine how difficult that is to navigate, you know? Yeah. It's an, and I think for me, a really big, like a kind of on that vein of appreciation and acknowledgement, what I try to do as a teammate and an athlete and not just a teammate in the sense of like, you're on a team. I, I think also in the sense of, a relationship with your parents or your significant other or your friends often the, the human mind is designed around the idea that we we want things to be the same and if something's not the same then it's bad we should take it out and we're, we're much better at acknowledging the things that aren't done properly so let's say like you go to work and you come back and your roommate has cleaned up the entire house everything looks great but they 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 didn't unload the dishwasher or like the, the bathtub is gross or something and you walk in you're like this thing looks disgusting and you kind of bring that up and then they go well well I'm, I'm never going to do that again like I'm never going to clean the house up because you haven't acknowledged you've acknowledged the thing that you that stands out to you and so I've made it a and it's a really tough mental exercise is to acknowledge and identify the things that are out of the ordinary in a good way and as a coach I find that a really difficult exercise because like sometimes you have a really, really bad practice and you come together as a team and you kind of say, I, I'm very honest with my, with my athletes. I'm like, Hey, we're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. That was a bad day. And then I'll normally pick out one of the, cause it, it tends to be one of the, the lower skilled athletes that do a really good job at being intentful and mindful and present in that situation. And I'll say to them, I think you did a really good job. I think you did a really good job at this. Like, I think it's important to build up the people that don't get acknowledged often which especially on sports teams, there are lots of people that you get one or two superstars and the rest of the team are all these role players, especially at the bottom of the bench, but they play roles. They're, they're, they're necessary for the success of the team. And so to acknowledge those people and to, to build them up, that only brings your team with you kind of in the, like in a, in a Frankelian sense, it's like you want people to go together. You want people to move together. And if you're constantly building up the top of that pyramid, the top of that dominance hierarchy, you've got your superstar and you're constantly saying, hey, this guy had a great game. I, I, um, yeah, you played NCAA. Do you know who uh, Tim Daubert is? Daubert, that sounds really, dude, Tim Daubert. Yeah, where's he from? He was BYU with Patch. 
Okay. And he was, he's this big German guy, but every time we'd come into practice and he ended up coming to TRU. So for his fourth and fifth year. And so we'd come into practice and a lot of the times our assistant coach would be like, like, man, Daubert's just killing it today. Like, why can't everyone just be like Daubert? Daubert's an absolute superstar, probably one of the better, like one of the best opposites to play in the Canada West. The, the dude was an absolute God in our, in our league. He was just this giant monster, super smart, this really personable guy. And, and it was tough being, being on a team with him because our assistant coach was constantly on this guy. Like this guy's sweet. This guy's the best. This guy's awesome. And there just wasn't, there wasn't anything pulling the people at the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. And so I try to do that as a teammate and an athlete and, and a friend. Like if I, if someone does something for the group, that's cool. I like really make a point of pointing that out. Hey man, that was sweet. I was at my friend's place before I left and we were making duck fry, duck fat potatoes, which are amazing. We like uh, had this whole night. We went and bought a duck, like a whole duck, fried the stuck up and then we siphoned the fat and then made a stock. And so we were making like cream mushroom soup or not cream mushroom, um, French, French, something, oh, French onion soup and right. like all these other things. We put this huge meal together. And I messed up with the timer or the temperature on the oven because it said put the oven to 200 and put in these like duck fat and sliced up potatoes. And I put it to 200 Fahrenheit, which it was supposed to be 200 Celsius. And mm. so put it in. And one of the, one of the guys is like, okay, I think we need to, my buddy Kyle is like, we need to drain the fat and like take some of the fat out because there was too much fat. And then we bumped the heat up. And like totally saved it. The meal was great. And I just kept on hammering this in. Like, dude, you saved dinner. Thank you. That was friggin' awesome. I really appreciate you kind of taking the step and taking the initiative to, to make that call, even though it's not, this isn't your area of expertise. You, you saved dinner. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that that's a tough thing to be conscious of is finding those <laughs> isolated events that aren't bad. And, acknowledging them yeah i mean for sure and you know to some degree it's like i have i don't know why something when you were when you were saying this story it made me think of like because everyone has like a teammate or a player or someone in your friend group who um like just shows up and seems to put in the work every day mm -hmm. but they're just not like i remember in hawaii there was this guy davis holt who just like big Hawaiian guy, not a good jumper, never really, like never was going to be any great, amazing player. Um, and when he was first on the team, we were together for four years when he was first on the team. He just, he was a guy who just showed up every day with like good attitude, put in fucking work, was clearly working 100%. Mm -hmm. We're like some of, and I was one of those people, especially in the later years, where like was one of the best players in the league. So I could sometimes was just like, fuck this practice, or fuck this, you know, I was a little more moody. This mm -hmm. guy was just every day, no matter what, puts in fucking work. Yeah. Or if he was upset or whatever, you could just never tell. And how those people, I look at some of those people now and I'm, sorry, my point is I still think about someone like him mm -hmm. now when I'm having tough times. Someone who didn't get the recognition all the time. You know, he didn't get the recognition of like, and eventually like finally for him his senior year, he did start to get some more recognition, which he fucking deserved. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they go their whole career, their whole life not really getting that kind of recognition and how, to your point, like how important that can be. And even more so, if you're that type of person, how much you don't realize like you have this huge effect on people, um, like this subconscious effect on so many people. Mm -hmm. And how this guy is someone I still think about like to this day, when I just like am pissed and find myself like bitching during a practice internally, you know? And I'm just like, dude, how did fucking Davis show up every day? Like this dude was, like really average, you know, showed up every day and just put in the work. And by senior year was like, you couldn't believe the things he was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's, there's something to be said about whether they go acknowledged or not, just like that ability to hone in on your role and realizing that like, whether you're the star of your team or not, like your role is so important, not just for you, but you don't even realize how important it is for the team in general. And just you know, and, and, and how contagious that can be. And that can mm -hmm. be a positive or a negative thing. Mm -hmm. You know, with that being said, like if you're the leader of a team and you're like choosing to take the day off, you'd be surprised at how many times that particular practice seemed to suck, but for everyone, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, 
yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting idea, especially on this, this concept of like really knowing, knowing your role mm -hmm. and how important that is to the unit and the environment in general. Yeah. Like something that I tried to do in the later half of my career was focus on the things that I was best at and not talk to anybody about the things that, that I wasn't excelling at. Maybe I didn't have to be as good as they were, but like in my, in Denmark, there were a few guys that would like never talk ever. And, and I would, and I, I made it my responsibility to communicate all the time because I think that's something that we control in sport and in life is our ability to communicate and our willingness to communicate. It's really tough. So many people have an issue with it because it's, it's hard to get out of your comfort zone and express yourself outwardly to people because number one, what, what do you know about anything? Why is your way better than theirs? But, but, and, and, and words. Number two, it was, I think that I can have a positive impact on my team by just bringing energy with noise and mm -hmm. always calling the ball, always talking about what was happening on our side of the net and their side of the net and having a constant flow of information. And for some people that doesn't work, but for some people, they just refuse to get into that at all. So, so the only time that I would call people out is when I was already doing that thing. And there was one practice where uh, one of the older guys, David, he's like 48. He's our libero. He's not, he's not 48. He's like 30 something, but he was like our old guy. Might as well. Yeah. He was our libero and, and he wasn't talking at all. And I was talking a lot and he was, he was this guy that was constantly talking about communication. And, and I, I walked up to him in the middle of one of our, our huddles or timeouts, not timeout. It was, it was practice. And we, we came in as a group and we talked a little bit. And as we're leaving, I'm like, hey, David, do you mind if I call you up for something in this drill? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, man, whatever. Because he he's comfortable with being yelled at or whatever. And I don't like to yell at people. But knowing that he was okay with it, I, it, made, it, more, it made me more comfortable. And there's like one, one sequence where he doesn't call the ball. And I just totally lose my mind on him and scream at him. And I'm like, David, why are you even here if you're not going to communicate? Why are you here if you're not talking? You're not making us better. You're not making yourself better this is shitty, like, get out if you're not going to be better. And he stayed in because we had had the conversation before. And then all of the younger guys in the practice were immediately like just dialed in. Everyone was talking, everyone was communicating because they, they saw that. I, I don't think that it's conducive to a successful team to snap on the least successful guy all the time. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think that it helps to have a, a, a beating boy at the bottom of the hierarchy that just gets yelled at all the time for messing up drills and messing everything up. Sure. And I think that by having an understanding and communicating, I had a, my best friend in the world, one of my best friends in the world, Charlie, I lived with him for forever. He was the same age as me in the same position. And I would always yell at him for not communicating. And I think that that increased other people's willingness to communicate because everyone knew that I loved Charlie and I wasn't coming at Charlie from this place of hatred. I was like, I want Charlie to be better. And I'm going to be on his case until he gets better. And I think this is one way that I can do it. And I think that that brought other people up is to see people at the top wanting to get better and pushing themselves to get better. So I think people at the bottom go, I, I have an opportunity to get better. Like, this guy's not going to yell at me. This guy's going to be supportive of me. I want to grow with the team. I want to grow with him. I want to follow along. Mm. Dude, that's, first of all, that's great. That's great that you can you could create that type of environment in your in your practice and because I'll say it's so hard to create that's the something we struggle with here it's like you're on a team with guys from all over the world mm -hmm. it's what's so different about maybe playing in a university somewhere for the yeah. most part um, for most universities like here it's dude we got guys from Ukraine Slovenia like Romania mm -hmm. and Australia and the U S like. Yeah, we all think very differently. Yeah. And uh, to have that ability to um, create that type of environment where it's this, where it's based on respect, it's based on this reality that hopefully we all live in where we're all, we've all left our homes to come be here to pursue mastery in this skill. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to, you need to hold each other accountable. Um, and it's, it's so funny because when I look at there's a lot of times where you're on a team where you need to be the leader. And then there's times where like you're the young gun and like you get to enjoy um, being led mm -hmm. in learning in that way. But I've always, I always found myself having a hard time because I'm not the one to like really yell at people. 
Mm -hmm. um, in the same time, I'm the, for sure the one to express how we feel. I'll, I'll be the one to like, you guys are all talking shit in the locker room. Like, I'm gonna go to the coach's office and be like, hey, we're all talking shit about your drills or your whatever, you know? Yeah. Like trying to be that medium. But, but really, I think what makes the most, what creates the most opportunity for success is creating that environment internally uh, as a team without coach or an adult or a figure kind of like setting that path for you or creating that environment. Mm -hmm. um, even if that's just like in your case, it sounds like just you and that one older guy. And then the, the trickle down effect is now the younger guys like, Oh shit, let me fucking step it up mm -hmm. and pass this free ball. Perfect. Every time or whatever yeah. it is, you know? And uh, I think there's like, so there's just so much value in, in holding yourself accountable and what that does. I mean, cause that's, that's what I really take from some of that, you know, is, um because in calling someone else out it also holds you accountable because you can't be the guy to call someone out and then be like you know slacking or choosing not to transition or like just kind of like fluffing around yeah and that's something that i've actually been trying to do a lot in my life currently is to voice my opinion that's why i'm posting some of the stuff and doing putting out a little more on my end to hold myself accountable to do something good Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's so easy to be like, oh, I would love to help people or uh, give my time up or, or do whatever. And, and I think it's another thing to whether it's like financial putting down I know those websites where you can literally be like, if I don't do this thing, donate $500 to like, I don't know, the KKK or like some fucked up thing that you would never <laughs> do. You know, so you're like, oh, my God, I can't donate the money. You should not be donating money to the KKK or whatever yeah. the fuck it is, you know? And, uh, but I, I do think there is so much value in having someone hold you accountable. And because I think it also like you have someone hold you accountable and in the same way that alone holds you accountable mm -hmm. for your actions or what you're trying to do. Um, but that's like a hard, it's so much easier to be selfish, you know? Yeah. And that's really like not calling that teammate out or not calling your libero out is being selfish because mm -hmm. you have the ability to, to, um, hold someone accountable, someone that you know wants to progress, and by not saying anything to that teammate or whatever, like you're doing them a disservice. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a hard skill, I think, especially for younger players, but even for most professionals I know to to do. Yeah, like I've I've played with guys that I don't like before, and I'll I'll consciously be like, oh, like he's not pressing this arm over, he's not making this step. I'm not going to say anything to him. Cause I, mm -hmm. I don't want that guy to get better because I, I don't like him. Like it's, and, and I mean, that's a, that's one of my unlimited numerous flaws as a human being is that I like, will, like, I'll, I'll develop that. I'll like, like, I don't like how you talk to people. I don't like how you talk to me. I'm not going to be a part of you getting better. I'm not going to take <laughs> negativity and give you positivity, but in, in a, in a same vein, different, or, let's say like same arm, different vein. Um, I've, I've found it really helpful to have a conversation with people individually on the team and ask them, how do you like to be spoken to? Like, is it okay if I yell at you? Do you want to be spoken to like an angel? Do you want to be like, do you want me to coddle you and just like, Hey, everything's okay. Everything's fine. Or do you want me to slap you in the face a little bit and say, Hey, wake up. We got to go. Like, do you, Dude, it's do you, so it's so funny to hear you say that because we literally, it just so happens like as of like two weeks ago, we had like our, Final, like for once, season kind of team. We're doing really well. We're second in the league right now, so we're doing really well in the league. Mm -hmm. But we've like won some games in five. We probably should have lost, and like we just happen to be a really talented team. Mm -hmm. But anyways, there's been kind of uh, this like a lot of things internalizing on the team. Guys like talking shit about the trainings and the coaches, and then guys kind of foreigners talking shit on the French guys. French guys talking shit on the foreigners, yep. and we finally just like we had a shit practice and our coach called it early for the first time ever. Our coach is like a really good dude, but he's just not the guy to yell. He's not the guy to hold someone accountable to be like, dude, you need to pass that free ball perfectly. Or dude, that ball landed in front of you. Didn't fucking go for it. You need to fucking go for it. Like sometimes I wish for as much as I'm like, I hate coaches that just yell for no reason. Sometimes yeah. I also need, you need that authority figure to be like, Hey, this is the standard, you know? Yeah. And to hold that standard. Anyways, you got practice short. We all go in the locker room and we start, um, we had this conversation that ended up being like the best thing ever. Cause now we're talking shit to each other's faces, but we're like being like, okay, we're the common goal here is like, we want to hold each other accountable and get better. When you act like this, it makes me feel like this. And just amazing conversation. Mm -hmm. What I found in my experience, because the irony is like, 
literally the before the practice we had this big meeting the reason i was pissed all through practice partly was because i was say i i had said so that the game we had lost prior to that first monday practice the game on saturday um you know one of our outsides like was getting served off the court basically mm-hmm. and was having like if you looked at his face you'd be like dude this guy's the most unconfident like he just looked like you know he's like yeah, yeah okay blah, 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 but like wasn't real like, he looked nervous scared yeah. and i remember saying in that meeting i'm like dude i want to know like how do you guys need to be spoken to like dude when you're i'm not a receiver so mm-hmm. i'm obviously not going to be like even though i could give you technical help because i'm someone who knows the game really well mm-hmm. i would never tell an outside how to pass just never because yeah. i'm not the fucking i'm not a great passer mm-hmm. i would never tell you how to do that but I want to be able to communicate to you in a way that pulls you out of your own head because right. in a match, there's no time, like there's no time for you to take off. So if you, you know, get blocked three times in a row or you get aced twice in a row, like what can I do? Some guys want to be yelled at like the mm-hmm. Slovenian guy. He just comes from a culture where that's just what they did. Yeah. They have this like level of off court respect for each other where they fucking yell. And if you were just an observer, you'd be like, Oh, these guys hate each other. Mm-hmm. But that's just a part of how they're the, who's raised culturally in the sport. And probably in general. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's just so funny because when you mentioned, like, when to talk about it, like, this kid actually hates when I bring up this kind of stuff. He's like, we do so much talking. We, like, talking, talking. He's more about, like, just show up and fucking do your thing. And if this guy fucks up, fuck him. But, like, yeah. you still love each other at the end of the day. And there's something kind of cool about that. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I'm like, I've always been so, I've, I've noticed that it seems to be, like, a bit more of a French thing mm-hmm. where they just don't they feel like they can't change something. So it's like, not nah, practices, like for example, our practices are like, like I told you, been pretty boring. Yeah. And we've been asking, like, do we play six on six, but we don't even play with a scoreboard. Like we don't compete. Right. You need a fucking scoreboard to compete. Yeah. Like it's a silly thing, but it's just how it works. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of the French guys are like, well, he, that's just how he is as a coach. We can't change it. So we're just going to talk shit about it and sucks and whatever. We'll just show up. Yeah. Where I'm much more like, no, like everyone talks shit on it let's go i'm gonna go into his office and be like hey we need a scoreboard mm-hmm. and they'll say yeah, yeah yeah and maybe one day out of the week there was a scoreboard everyone's still talking shit i'm like no i'm not the captain of this team but i'll i'll go into the office and be like yo what's going on and it's just blown my mind that it's like it feels like the easiest thing to do being honest with how you feel feels like it should be the easiest thing to do in the world mm-hmm. and yet for a lot of people for whatever reason it's such a hard thing to do and that's not just like with sport but just in general being like hey i don't like this or i don't think that's a good idea or it's such a it's such an interesting like topic of conversation in the sense too of like even americans seem to be like the quote-unquote soft Mm -hmm. you know where uh they're really sensitive and you have to kind of sugarcoat things to communicate the way what you really say and where it's like on one hand i love this european style of just like no, that's ugly or no, that's stupid or whatever. Cause it's, that's just my opinion. And, and mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and then on the other hand, it's like, like oh, why is it so hard to just like express how you feel? Like if mm-hmm. you're, you know, and uh, I think a lot, I think a lot of it does come from um, just the ability to respect, like have respect for your teammate, for your friend. And if you really do respect those people and choose to engage with that person, like part of your duty then as a friend is to call your friends out. Mm -hmm. you know yeah and uh it's just i think for a lot of people it's just so hard and they don't realize it's such a disservice to not call people out Mm -hmm. and even just a disservice to yourself as well like i'm i'm personally someone that's super agreeable i i think that it's a personality trait where you don't want to rock the boat it's Mm -hmm. a little bit wavy already you want to keep things as calm as possible and that that helps to be agreeable in that circumstance i have to work really hard to be disagreeable and to call people out and to say, hey, I don't like that. I don't like how you're treating me. I, I, I don't like to be spoken to that way. Like, that's tough. And I think it's easier to just kind of let things go. And let the, I think over time, it devolves a lot faster if you do let that stuff go. So I think that's something that people have to find, like a middle ground. And maybe a super disagreeable person has to learn how to be more agreeable to other people. And just be like, okay, they said that. I'm just going to let it go. And agreeable people need to learn to find that other side of the spectrum and they find balance in like, okay, I need to, I need to call that person out. I need to stick up for myself. I need to Mm -hmm. negotiate for myself. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, (laughs) 
the main point there is like everyone has their balance and that balance mm-hmm. looks so different for each individual yeah. to, to what you were saying, you know? Yeah. Dude, man, we've been, this, we've been crushing it. This and is sweet. To be completely honest with you, I could speak for like hours longer, but it's like, what time is it right now? Almost 10 30. Yeah, man, I'm, you, uh, you get to bed. Let's let's do this again some other time, man. Seriously, that for was, sure. I that think was you asked sweet. me like one question, so this was fucking amazing that we just spoke for three hours. Yeah, <laughs> that was like a ton of fun. I really enjoyed that. Here, I'll put this on pause, and then we can have like an actual goodbye.